So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to day three of our Ecological Economics for All Summer Crash Course 2022. The theme, the shift needed in economics to enable a just transition to a right size economy. Welcome. We would like to thank again our co-sponsors, the leadership for the Ecozoic, the Gun Institute for Environment, uh, Rethinking Economics, UVM, the International Society for Ecological Economics, the Petersdorf Professorship in Sustainability Science and Policy, and the Democracy Collaborative. So I'm gonna, yeah, again, I'm, I just wanna give you an overview of what we're trying to do with Ecological Economics for All. We're trying to follow the non Meadows' five tools for sustainability, uh, including, you know, we, we gotta have, we gotta be visioning, truth telling, networking, co-learning and loving, and we included collaborating. And we are taking these, these tools very seriously. And I think a lot of people can agree that is a, is a good way forward. Um, so we have a global participation for our uh, Ecological Economics for All crash course. Um, we have 30% from North America, Central America and the Car Caribbean, 8% from South America, uh, 36 percent from Europe, 18 percent from Asia, six percent from Africa, and two percent from Oceania. So I know a lot of you are different time zones, and I really appreciate that. I know you're you're watching or or, or rewatching even the the live streams uh, on YouTube, and it's important that you guys keep sharing them because that that helps us spread the the knowledge to all. Uh, so what best describes you? I ask you this question when you sign up, when you register. And a lot of you are undergraduate and graduate students, teachers, academics, postdocs, practitioners, activists, private and public sectors, and a bunch of you uh, call yourselves hybrids of some sort. And, and, hopefully, and the, I'm thankful that most of you are consider yourselves human beings who just want to learn. And that always makes me smile. Uh, so have you ever taken a course on economics? Um, uh, Seventy-six percent say yes. Twenty-four percent said no. That 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 tells you that tells a lot of how how mainstream economics is so pervasive, and hopefully you're getting a lot from this course. And have you ever taken a course on pluralist or heterodox economics, such as ecological economics, feminist economics, post-Keynesian economics? Um, most of you, fifty-eight percent said no. Uh, Thirty-seven percent say yes. And 5% said other. Uh, and again, I, I hope that you're getting a lot from this course to, to strengthen your heterodox knowledge. Um, so today is day three of our course. Um, and the theme is the role of systems thinking and heterodox economics in a new economic story. Uh, we have first Leslie Arun, uh, who, will, who is the executive uh, 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 Democracy Collaborative, and and she, I'm I'm just gonna hand it over to her, so I don't take more of her time. Thank you, Rigo. Thank you, Rigo. It's uh, delightful to be here, and I really appreciated that you invited me. And I'm really excited to see that so many people are coming from all over the world. This is, uh, um, it just makes me feel like heterodox economics and sort of new economic thinking is really taking taking hold around the world. Let me start by telling you a little bit about the Democracy Collaborative, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself that's not in the bio. You can read my bio anytime. Um, the Democracy Collaborative is a research and development lab building a just, democratic, and regenerative economy for everyone. We've been around about 22 years, and we're known for two things. The first is a concept and approach called community wealth building. Community wealth building is a bottom-up approach to local and regional, regional economic development that centers shared economic ownership of institutions and community self-determination. It's intentionally reparative and inclusive by design, and its successful models are attracting global interests from Cleveland, Ohio to Scotland, from Preston, England to Tanzania, and from Chicago to Australia. And by the way, if you've heard of community wealth building and are curious to learn more, we're actually hosting a webinar about it next week. And I invite you to sign up. I will put it in the chat. The 
Democracy Collaborative is also known for a program that we started about seven years ago called the Next System Project. We launched the Next System Project when we realized the challenges facing society aren't merely political or economic, they're actually systemic. They're deeply interconnected and built into the DNA of our culture, our economy, our institutions and our values. So our solutions have to be systemic too. NSP has re recently morphed into a new program called Next System Studies, which I run. The goal of Next System Studies is to build the praxis, evidence, and narratives that we need to inspire a next generation of actors and institutions, hopefully many of you out there, to use democratic ownership practices and to produce economic and social well-being for all within a flourishing natural world. As part of this, we're starting an inter international network of practitioners and academics committed to next system thinking and acting and who generate, share, and integrate next system scholarship stories, empirical work, models, and pedagogy throughout higher education and mainstream society. The University of Vermont is a close partner with us in this work. If you'd like to learn more about it, email me. I'll put my email address in the chat later. So a little bit about me, that's not in my bio. I am not really an expert on anything. Um, I'm a generalist, a synthesist, a big picture thinker who really cares deeply about being fair to everybody and preserving and protecting all life. I grew up in rural Vermont in a tiny beige house on the side of a lonely back road. We had a huge garden where we grew most of our vegetables. My father was raised on a farm in Colorado. And beyond that was a glorious wetland. I spent most of my free time exploring and just being in that lush, mucky, earthy smelling wonderland with a teeming community of birds, frogs, snakes, chipmunks, and lots of mosquitoes who never failed to fascinate me. I loved that swamp, I bonded with it, and it gave me self-confidence, a strong sense of independence, and a deep love for nature. I came back to visit my swamp after my first year of college to discover that it had been drained and turned into an industrial park. I can't tell you how shocking and painful that was. That was my awakening. That was when I started to ask questions about our economy's relationship with our environment and about how we make decisions about what's important to both people and nature. I've been working on these issues for a quarter century now and it's still interesting, it's still a challenge, and it's more urgent than ever. Preparing for this talk today was hard. There's a lot of negativity, violence, and despair in the world right now, and I've been feeling it. I know all of you have been feeling it. At the same time, working to change our political economic system to make it more democratic, inclusive, and sustainable fires me up. It's rewarding, fascinating, and it gives me hope. Over the past decade, I've seen positive change begin to snowball, and I've seen the backlash to that. Neoliberalism has definitely lost its luster, and lots of new ideas and approaches are emerging. But we have to keep pushing for the good ones, and we have to offer a vision that can pull people forward with us. I've been asked to talk about harnessing systems thinking to bring about economic democracy. Let's start with why we need to change our economic thinking and acting. Our economy isn't actually working for anyone, not the poor, not the marginalized, not the middle class, not even the 1%. Since the 1980s, we thought of the, we've thought of the economy as an immoral machine that efficiently provides incentives and distributes resources. We've acted as though the neoliberal structures, tax cuts, and government subsidies that benefit corporations will lead to economic activity that lifts all boats. Clearly, neither of these is true. The values that undergird this orthodox system prioritize self-interest and limitless accumulation, and too often reward and even require exploitation. This simplistic, biased, and outdated economic system has brought us a global pandemic, the climate crisis, historical inequality, long-standing racial and gender, gender injustice, and authoritarianism, among other things. Its constellation of beliefs, the economy is an equilibrium system, 
individuals and institutions are rational and efficient optimizers, that's me. Network relationships don't matter. The market will fix everything. Wealth will trickle down, have lost their credibility. These ideas just aren't common sense anymore. As a result, people have lost faith and trust in leadership across the board. This has created a lot of fear and anger. Our economic dysfunctions aren't just impacting our jobs and pocketbooks. They're impacting every aspect of our lives, including our identities, our relationships, our planetary life support system, and our sense of possibility for the future. This economic system is woefully inadequate for the challenges we face as a civilization in the 21st century. It has literally put us on a collision course with collapse. Okay. Now that we've got the problem out of the way, let's talk about what we want and need and how we get there. Everybody wants an economic system that works for them. It matters to most people that they live in a just, fair, and safe society in which they and their children have the opportunity to thrive economically, socially, physically, and creatively. They want to live with dignity and respect, and they crave a sense of identity and belonging. What this means to me is that we need a new kind of moral political economy that centers people. A political economy grounded in inclusive economic rights that provide the foundation and opportunity that everyone requires to thrive. What this grounding requires is equitable, equitably sufficient access to material needs, healthcare, education, and capital. Likewise, most people care about the environment and they don't want human activities to jeopardize a healthy planet and the well-being of future generations. I'd argue that most people would agree that society to be successful over the long term needs to figure out how to actualize Kate Rayworth's donut. As Kate describes it, the donut can be thought of as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century with the aim of meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. I know you will hear more about this tomorrow from Kate herself, so I won't say any more about it. The question is then, how do we create such a society? How do we move from a liberal democracy in which political rights are conceived in isolation from economic and social equity to a society that enjoys full democratic ownership of institutions, businesses, capital, and politics, and well-being for all? What are the shared values, narratives, institutions, and outcomes that would characterize such a system? Who gets to decide and how do we get there from here? What can heterodox economics lead, what, how can heterodox economics lead us to transformative systems change? We've been operating under flawed economic ideas for a long time including ideas from over two centuries ago that still influence how people in positions of power think about markets, regulation, and the role of the state. More recently, the Chicago economists, led by Milton Friedman, set the stage for the Reagan-Thatcher era and today's corporatocracy. So many of these ideas are recycled and stale, but until recently, they've enjoyed significant lock-in. Today, we're in a profound state of political, economic, social, and ecological transition. The 2008 financial collapse shook the foundations of neoliberalism and its walls have started to teeter. At the same time, we're moving out of the industrial era to a new era, whether we call it the ecozoic, the Anthropocene, the technological, or the knowledge area, era, and these changes are catalyzing a lot of new thinking. Economic ideas matter especially during periods when mainstream beliefs are crumbling and mindsets are shifting. If we hope to achieve an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economy, we need heterodox economic ideas, those that are different from our conventional ideas, and we need lots of them. As Eric Beinhocker, Executive Director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and Professor of Public Policy Practice at Oxford University writes, New economic thinking scrambles, breaks up, and reforms old dividing lines and debates. It's not just a matter of pragmatic centrism, of compromise, of even a third way. Rather, new economic thinking provides something altogether different, a new way of seeing and understanding the economic world. When viewed through the eyeglasses of new economics, the old right-left debates don't just look wrong, 
they look irrelevant. New economic thinking will not end economic or political debates. There will always be issues to argue over, but it has the promise to reframe those debates in new and hopefully more productive directions. I'm gonna put in the chat the references, oops, that I'm using here. So if you're interested, you can all read about them later. Best practices for heterodox economics could be characterized as a research program that encompasses a broad range of theories, empirical work, and methods. It is also highly interdisciplinary, involving not only economists, but psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists, historians, physicists, biologists, mathematicians, computer scientists, and others across the social and physical sciences. The common threads running through this broad research program must be a strong desire to make economic theory better reflect the empirical reality of the economy and to create an economic system that responds to the moral and regenerative needs of society and on our planet. So this is a time when we all need to be thinking outside the box, as well as experimenting, collaborating, and sharing what we're learning. In my humble opinion, the best, and I believe the first primary resource for heterodox political economic thinking is the New Systems Reader, edited by Gus Beth and Kathleen Courier. Gus is a distinguished fellow of the Democracy Collaborative's Next System Project. And if you've never heard of him, he's had an enormously outsized impact on, on the conservation and environmental fields and is just an amazing human being. The book represents a rich, deep resource of material relevant to a broad range of disciplines, economic sustainability, business, public policy, sociology, political science, etc. And it's already being used as a core text in courses in multiple universities in the United States. If you would like a copy of this book, just let me know. I want to give you a couple examples of heterodox economic thinking that I think is really courageous and long overdue and that have had an extraordinarily difficult, um, difficult time seeing the light of day because of powerful cultural and economic forces that prevent us from seeing and acknowledging them. Hey, Leslie, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, your, your chats are only going to the panelists. If you see that, oh. little, see that little drop down box and click it to everyone. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. I copied and pasted your first three chats, but just so you have, so you can do that. Okay. Sorry, panelists. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe these emerging ideas could help provide the foundation for a transition to economic democracy, a system in which people share ownership and decision making over the power and resources in their communities, rather than profit and pure self interest. Economic democracy is grounded in values of solidarity, cooperation, democracy and sustainability. As I go through these examples, listen for the common themes that run through them. Let's start with race and racial disparities, looking through this lens of stratification economics and emerging heterodox economics discipline. I'll give you a few examples of the racial disparities that I'm talking about. First, in terms of wealth, the typical black family owns just one eighth the wealth of the typical white family in the United States. Never in the country's history have median black families had even one fifth the wealth of white families. And Americans tend to underestimate the size of the wealth gap by 40 to 80%. But what about employment and wages? Black workers are consistently about twice as likely as white workers to be unemployed at any time in the business cycle. Black and brown workers are also more likely than white workers to be in jobs with lower wages, worse or no benefits, and greater risk of bodily harm. Even when controlling for educational attainment, black workers are paid less than white workers and are less likely to find work in the first place. Health is an exacerbating factor. Due to similar disparities in the health sector, black Americans live shorter, sicker lives than white Americans and are subject to higher rates of mortality. This includes infant and maternal mortality, both of which are more than twice as high for black Americans as white Americans. Stratification economics seems to, 
seeks to understand the causes and consequences of group-based disparities like these and to develop solutions for them. It studies the implications of policies that affect whole communities and populations across history. Unlike neoliberalism, it starts with groups, not individuals. What it's showing us is that there's a deep cultural and political misunderstanding about the origins of racial and other disparities. And that this misunderstanding comes from the idea that any individual's lot in life is solely due to their innate capabilities and their willingness to work hard. In other words, anybody can get ahead if they just apply themselves, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. This mindset reflects the neoliberal construct of rugged individualism or makers and takers, and the idea that you get what you deserve. So the conclusion that so many people, including policymakers, draw is that these people and, those, and these communities of people who are wealthy, healthy, and employed are so because they are more capable than their poor, sick, unemployed counterparts. Interestingly, these baked in disparities often economically disadvantage all workers and all people and consolidate power upwards. From the stratification economics perspective, the hyper incarceration and hyper unemployment of black Americans can be viewed as population management strategies that reduce the bargaining power of all workers in an absolute sense, but improve the bargaining power of non black workers in a relative sense. When Black Americans are kept disproportionately on the margins of the labor market, the unemployment rate is pushed higher, weakening the position of all workers. When they are removed from the, from the labor market entirely, competition for scarce employment moves in favor of non-Black workers. This maintenance of relative group position is key to understanding how policies that undermine the socioeconomic conditions in which Black people live so consistently are allowed to go unchallenged. They improve capitalist prospects for acquiring cheap labor and allow non-Black workers to maintain a larger share of the small economic pie afforded to the working class. So it's the divide and conquer strategy. What we're learning from stratification economics is that group-based disparities, white versus Black, male versus female, provide and protect the dominant group's material benefits and power. As a result, these disparities are viewed as rational and are perpetuated by the dominant social groups. It shows how American institutions, laws, and norms were set up by white Americans to preserve their economic dominance and how they limit opportunities for Black Americans. Meanwhile, our conventional policy approaches to solving racial equities, inequities focus on developing the human capital of Black individuals, in other words, by fixing Black people, either using education to improve their decision-making processes or shifting cultural habits to be less draining of wealth, health, and responsibility. According to Jim Stewart, one of the economists responsible for developing stratification economics, group identities are treated as produced forms of individual and collective property with both income and wealth generating characteristics. Group-based identities like race play a functional role in shaping economic inequality. According to Patrick Mason, another stratification economist, race is a form of individual and group property. That is a wealth generating characteristic. When resources are scarce and it's possible to exclude others from partaking in those resources, identity can be used as a deciding factor in who gets access and who does not. This is why identity group membership holds value, even within capitalist economies, which are supposed to operate as free markets. In other words, identity has real economic value that both individuals and groups put effort into protecting and maintaining, and it's often directly related to as access to the resources necessary to maintain power and hierarchy. While this may seem obvious to many of you, group-based identity and lock-in and lock-in disparity fly in the face of orthodox economic theory and practice. Challenging these beliefs using empirical evidence and offering common sense alternatives that can lead to profound positive change in the lives of most people, black and white, provides a powerful argument for heterodox economics, not to mention a new economic paradigm. My second example comes from my brilliant democracy collaborative colleague, Marjorie Kelly. 
Marjorie is the author of, divine, of The Divine Right of Capital, which has been credited by Jay Gilbert, founder of B Lab, as being the inspiration for the B Corporation movement. She also wrote with Ted Howard, the president and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, The, Dem the Making of a Dem Democratic Economy. And I'll put both these in the chat too. Oops. Marjorie provides another example of an implicit bias built into the DNA of our political economy. This one is also wreaking havoc on the vast majority of people, as well as all life on Earth, and it's even more insidious. The bias that Marjorie identifies is capital, and she's writing her next book on it. As one illustration of capital bias, Marjorie uses the $4 billion in debt relief, the $4 billion in debt relief for minority farmers that was proposed as part of the Biden administration's $1.9 trillion pandemic stimulus package. When this debt relief package was proposed, the banks set to receive the loan forgiveness payouts on behalf of the farmers, which included all interest due, complained it would deprive them and their investors of a stream of income to which they were entitled. Okay, you might say, but it doesn't stop there. To appease the banks, the government planned the extraordinary step of paying them 120% of the outstanding amounts due. They would get the entire principal owed to them, all interest owed, plus 20% to compensate for additional taxes and fees and bother. Still, in the bankers' minds, in their understanding of their financial rights, the anticipated future income to be extracted from the backs of struggling black farmers was sacrosanct. They argued their loss should be compensated. Of course, their loss failed to compare with the loss of the farmers who stood to lose everything. Now, as Marjorie argues, this is not about the greed or racist attitudes of bankers, not completely anyway. What this is about is a cultural worldview that has become so ingrained and so pervasive, so normalized, that it's almost invisible. The implicit bias that we grant to capital has allowed its interests to become superior to those of people's livelihoods and well being, as well as to continue life on the planet. Capital has been granted a godlike status to feed the perpetual growth of shareholder returns even as its mothers, families, and communities, our real economy, our financial economy is six times larger than our GDP economy. Our creativity, our altruism, and our climate, our food security, and the future of our civilization. And yet we view it as simply the way things are. Marjorie explains that capital bias is a form of what we also call wealth bias or class bias, the bias woven through our culture that in countless ways favors persons of wealth. It's about how the script of our economy is written from the point of view of capital, making the rest of us the other. It's about how shareholders alone are represented in corporate governance while workers are disenfranchised and dispossessed. It's about how the constitution prohibits takings from capital. While capital may take from others and the natural world at will. Capital bias is about how the script we live within assumes that social institutions like corporations exist to benefit capital owners, that billionaires are rock stars to be admired, that money in politics is free speech, that business schools are right to teach maximizing gains to shareholders as the aim of management, that the aim of investing is accumulating limitless more of capital. Racial bias and wealth bias are deeply entwined. For centuries, the two biases hand in hand served to dispossess people of color through the merciless histories of colonialism, the slave trade, plantations, the taking of indigenous land, predatory lending, gentrification, and more. If most of us now understand the racism threaded through these processes, we may also be able to see how these acts of racism were deployed along with a second interwoven force the cultural construct of property. Who is permitted to own property? Who is turned into property? Who is deprived, deprived of property without recourse? Who is denied the vote because they don't own property? 
who is forbidden to own the fruits of their own labor and finds instead that such fruits are legally the property of another. Marjorie writes, here we begin to understand the different, the different logic of race bias and capital bias. While race bias persists, inflicting ongoing harm across generations, capital bias accelerates. Because of the endless expansion of investing portfolios, more and more of our world is continually falling under the control of and subject to extraction by capital. If people of color have long been primary targets for this extraction, today more and more of us and the planet itself are caught in its iron grip. In the case of the black farmers, it's worth noting that white farmers are also now losing land. In Wisconsin, where largely white owned dairy farms are once among the nation's most prosperous, the last decade has seen an alarming 40% of the dairy farms go under. As the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has documented, concentrated corporate power and lending practices are at the root. In short, as investors gain, family farms lose. People of color are hit first and hardest, but most of us are in the underclass now. So what underlying fundamental, often invisible social construct do both of these examples have in common? Um, put it in the chat. Uh, love to see what you guys are thinking. So what that is, at least for me, is the issue of property. The ownership and control of assets is the foundation of every political economic system and largely determines who has access to wealth and power and who doesn't. So it's not really about the economy, it's about property and power. Who owns what and why, and how the economy helps them control and hang on to what they believe they're entitled to. As Derek Hamilton, Grieve Chelwa, and Abby Green with the Institute for Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School for Social Research write in a moral political economy that puts people above property. I'll put this in the chat later. Absent from the neoliberal worldview is the role of power and capital and how the wealthy and powerful are able to alter the rules and structures of transactions and markets in the first place. And it's this absence that most needs correcting through the adoption of a moral political economy that addresses the problems inherent in the neoliberal economic model. Neoliberalism's emphasis on freedom and choice naturalizes poverty and inequality instead of grounding them as the results of government actions or inactions that leave those without resources and power subject to the whims of charity or vulnerable to exploitation and predation by those with power and resources in a proverbial market. A truly moral economy would be undergirded by different values. Values such as economic inclusion, civic engagement, social equity, human dignity, sustainability, and shared prosperity. And far from denying the importance of race and other identity group stratifications, a moral political economy would put in place policies and structures to ensure that racial identity and the accrued advantages associated with racial identity retain no transactional value whatsoever in determining material outcomes. Indeed, property is one of two broad constructs shaping the formal legal structure of society. French economist Thomas Piketty observed that every society has a political regime and a property regime. Note he did not say economic regime, but property regime. In a way not often recognized, property forms the foundation of every economy, its base of power. Property regimes are ownership regimes and they define an economy. Thus, we need a new framework of economic policies that put people and nature above property. Such policies must anchor inclusive economic rights on the idea that all individuals require equitable access to a set of enabling goods and services, sufficient income, shelter, food, healthcare, education, capital, employment, that provide them with the capacity to reap the benefits of their labor and ingenuity. To enable all people to participate in the economy and the body politic and to promote human flourishing, we need public interventions to counterbalance accrued economic and racialized power. But how do we bring about the systems change that we need to build such power and wealth in communities to create an economy where assets are broadly held and locally rooted over the long term so that income recirculates rather than being extracted, creating stable prosperity? 
Doing this requires us to develop, to develop plural forms of ownership across the full spectrum of assets, resources, enterprises, and services that collectively transfer wealth and power from the hands of the few to the control of the many. Community wealth building is a great example of this. The goal is not to simply build one-off projects, a co-op here, a social enterprise there, nor to tinker around the edges to attempt to even out the malign effects of our current deeply unequal and unjust economic model. It's instead to pursue fundamental changes to the ordinary operations of the system, to literally rewire it such that it's capable of reliably generating positive outcomes in and of itself. Systems change doesn't need to occur at some grand revolutionary scale, at least not at first. It can and most likely will involve building alternatives at a localized or regional scale through experimentation, collaboration, and self-determination. People are ingenious when given the resources and the chance to solve problems together. Those who spend their lives embedded within local industries, energy, food, transportation, money, housing, education, healthcare, et cetera, possess the greatest insight, desire, and ingenuity to create new choices where they didn't exist before. They, better than anyone, can conceive of and construct the political, administrative, and institutional relationships needed to incentivize and reward the cooperative problem solving that leads to economic and social inclusion that democratizes the ownership of public goods and capital. What's missing from our property regime is this democratic sensibility, a deep conviction that all persons have equal dignity embodied in institutions and practices that bring this norm to life. If democracy were present, if concern for the public good were built into the structures and norms of property, corporations and capital, it would be a system designed to be responsive to many voices, to honor the centrality of government by the people, to bring economic power and assets to all of us, to keep life on this planet thriving, even as companies and investments continue in some evolved, more mature form. Moving beyond capitalism may seem impossible. Most change efforts are about reimagining, rethinking capitalism, creating moral capitalism, can we even imagine a whole new system beyond our capital centrist system? Can we imagine a next system where capital is not in control of, but instead fully in service to life? What are the pathways there? Similarly, how do we build a new narrative for this next system? How do we translate what a more moral economic system means for people today and for future generations? The US has an imagination gap when it comes to the economy. We generally think we have to choose one ism over another, like capitalism or socialism. But the reality is our options are as diverse as those who can dream them. To move from a societal imagina imagination deficit in the face of an economy that's failing to work for everyone, we need to cultivate imagination abundance. As one of my colleagues says, epiphanies of possibility. Paired with a grounding understanding of why changing how we each work and engage with each other matters in bringing us to a better place. A narrative reflects a shared interpretation of how the world works, who holds power and how they use it is both embedded in and supported by dominant narratives. Successful narrative change shifts power as well as dominant narratives. Societal narratives run deep, spread through cultural expectations and channels like school, the workplace, pop culture and the arts, family structures, legal systems, et cetera. Though deep-seated, it's possible to shift dominant narratives and it starts with creating dissonance between what is and what could be. This sense of disharmony is both an uncomfortable and powerful catalyst for change. When accompanied by real world examples of what could be and practical tools for taking action, this dissonance will encourage many people to take the first steps toward shifting practices in their own lives. Together, these shifts made by many groups of people can bring us closer to economies that prioritize long-term community well-being, shared power and prosperity and healing. Negative forces seem to have the upper hand today. But as somebody said, new realities are created by new realities are never created by realists. Transformative change cannot happen overnight, but as its benefits become clear, it may happen more rapidly than once seemed possible. So 
it's really important for all of us to to step outside of our of our normal boxes and really do some hard thinking about the ideology of of uh, neoliberalism and and how we've all bought into it for such a long time and slowly release ourselves from that trap through through heterodox thinking and also just engaging as as people within our own communities and engaging as citizens more so than consumers. So thank you very much. I hope I've been a little bit provocative. Um, I hope I've made some people a little bit uncomfortable. So we start talking about these issues uh, more deeply. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie. That was incredibly, uh, I don't know, incredibly elegant the way you exposed your, your work and and connect it all with systems thinking and heterodox economics. And I want to start just quickly with a question that um, I said I would ask you actually. Um, and it is how do you, you know, work with different heterodox schools of, of economics in, in your own work? I know you, we, we spoke about this before, and you consider yourself, even though you're very broad in your approach, uh, close to complexity economics, for example. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so yeah, somebody asked me once if I had to decide to, to um, decide what kind of an economist I was going to be, I, I would be a complexity economist because our, our world and our economic system are extraordinary, extraordinarily complex and they take they have to take into account our economic system has to take into our account our different cultures, our different histories. Um, our biophysical world upon which all of this depends, our psychologies, everything, you name it. And so um, it's really important to be able to, uh, I won't say manage that complexity because I'm not sure that as mere humans, we're able to manage that complexity, but to try to understand it and, and, and protect ourselves um, in a way or or to create a system within that complexity that benefits everyone that's inclusive but also really keeps us within planetary boundaries in terms of um sort of working within all of these wonderful heterodox ideas that are emerging like ecological economics and uh, institutional economics and stratification economics which is which is new to me um, and feminist economics, I think we just, um, we have to be better at talking to each other and working together and focusing and improving because we're not very good at this. We haven't been trained to do this. We're trained to do exactly the opposite of this, but to improving our ability to work across systems and to be inclusive um, and and I would say to do empirical evidence so that we're really creating um, a body of economic work that aligns to reality, to what's actually happening on the ground. So it requires a lot of experimentation, um, a lot of failure and, and continuing to move forward from there. Thanks. And so I imagine that coming, you know, basing on this complexity economics, you also might think that using systems thinking as this bridge, if you will, for, that's how I see it too. You can, you can use systems thinking to bridge uh, among the different heterodox economics, draw from them yeah. with, a social, with a strong social and biophysical foundation and, and then yeah. try to address issues from there, right? Yeah, definitely. So I, you know, the new economy, whatever it looks like um, is emerging. There is something emerging. There's a lot emerging. And I feel like we're in this, this fabulous estuary of ideas. And as we communicate more, as we do more research, as we keep thinking and, and peeling the layers off of neoliberalism and our own beliefs about what the, what the economy should be, who gets what and why, what the role of the state is, all of those things that eventually uh, a new system will start to coalesce on, on top of a new value system, which is which is really what we need. So systems thinking is really important. Um, 
I decided I didn't have time to put up Danella, Danella Meadows places to intervene in the system. But I'm assuming since this is about systems thinking that somebody has done that or somebody will do that. But um, yeah. yeah, they can go on the website. We have a, one, of, one of the main theoretical uh, pillars, if you will, of ecological economics is a systems thinking approach. And they can yeah. find the paper and her book on uh, a primary yeah. systems thinking, which I would highly recommend and the, and the leverage points. Uh, which is what you were talking about. So we have somebody here asking a question, uh, Federico. He's asking, Leslie, you said the system is not working even for the 1%. Could you please explain this further? Yes. Well, um, the system isn't working for the 1%. It's certainly making them a lot of money. And it's certainly giving them a lot of political influence. But if you look at the larger um economic system if you look at the world um they are not the the one percent is not protected from climate change it's not protected from pandemics it's not protected from a future uh financial collapse which i which i expect will be upon us someday particularly given the fact that uh, the financial economy is six times larger than the real economy. So it's it's like this giant boulder sitting on top of a little rock. It's, it's gonna fall over. So I think in the short term, if you are Jeff Bezos or you know, Mark Zuckerberg, it may feel like, or Elon Musk, it may feel like you're really sitting pretty right now and the world is your oyster. But I think that's a false sense of, um, a false sense of prosperity or a false sense of whatever it is I'm trying to say. And uh, that they actually aren't, they aren't sitting in the driver's seat to the extent that they, that they feel they might be. Yeah, and, and that, that, that all goes back to, to this biophysical foundation, right? If this financial system is on completely untethered, which is, it seems yeah. that is becoming increasingly from the biophysical foundation, then yeah. what can you expect when you have planetary boundaries we're reaching planetary boundaries and so on. You will see the impact no matter what. Um, so there is another question here. Can you comment on how the lines of economic thought you have identified relates to system thinking? So I can guess- you say, just, say that one more time? Can you comment on how the lines of economic thought, meaning the heterodox economics uh, that you have identified in, in your discussion relate to systems thinking? So people wanna be more- we, Yes. Yeah. So, so the two examples that I gave, so capital bias is one and, and racial disparities is another. So without systems thinking, without um, really looking across different, different um, systems, different, so looking across um, racial disparities and really digging deeply into how our economy operates and blowing apart the mindsets that have been used to keep each of those systems in place, um, particularly, well, particularly both of them. Um, you know, if we, if we weren't engaging in systems thinking, if, if we weren't looking across different disciplines, if different heterodox disciplines weren't learning from each other, I, I don't think it's, it's, we're able to really unearth, um, I'm not explaining this very well, that we're not unable to see things that have become invisible to us. Uh, here's another example. So a lot of what we need as human beings that I would call part of the foundational economy, clean water, um, access to food, access to transportation, access to a, electricity and more recently the internet are things that people don't often fo focus on as necessary parts of our economic system of necessary things that need to be delivered to people in order for them to have thriving futures to make the most of the opportunities that are afforded to them and so without thinking in terms of systems particularly when you have this overarching ideology like neoliberalism in which 
all of those foundational things have been privatized instead of being viewed as something that we the people or the government needs to provide for us in order to have a decent quality of life and sufficient resources. Um, you never actually are able to, to identify these problems. You're not able to identify the solutions to those problems. And you know, you're just you're living in an ideological system. I've done a terrible job of explaining that, but I think I think it was a it was a it was a great a good question. Uh, it's a complicated it's a complicated question because you know it, there is so many different moving parts uh, when you're talking about it. But I think you did a good job. Um, so somebody else is asking here what what are the seeds? Parentheses questions, stories, provocation, or information you plan that are the most effective when speaking uh, with people that have a strong belief in the status quo. How do we change minds? Like the paradigm, right? Change the, minds. The paradigm shift. You know, one of the most important seeds for me is to help people identify themselves as citizens or re-identify themselves as citizens instead of seeing themselves merely as consumers who don't have any agency over um, the way that their political economic system operates. Um, Another seed that I think the Democracy Collaborative has been extraordinarily good at planting is this idea of community wealth building, is the idea that people and communities and regions can, can create their own wealth, they can keep it circulating within their economies if they just work together, um, if they collaborate and if they focus on keeping those resources within those communities through economic ownership of institutions, of land, of decision-making um, and local governance. So really for me, the seed I was trying to plant in this talk was that it isn't about the economy, it's about ownership. Who owns the institutions? Who owns the decision-making? Who owns the governance? Um, and who owns, you know, who has ownership over your own body? That's a, that's a big one that's, that's recently re-raised its head in the United States. So for me, ownership, um, learning how to be an active citizen, a good citizen, You're on mute, Rigo. Rigo, you're on mute. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And you know, I work a lot with Frederick Sadi, who is considered one of the pioneers of ecological economics. And in doing my second chapter on finance, yeah, he, he did mention a lot how the community must protect their wealth and prevent the, the financial sector in the, in, the, in the case of debt, right? The debt, debt dynamics from extracting their, their surplus wealth. <laughs> And yeah. so that's what we're working on, and I completely agree with you. So there was a question on impunity. Uh, where has been examples of such, you mentioned impunity in your talk, and somebody's asking, where has been uh, an example of where such impunity has been overturned? Making uh, the capitalist mode, I know. Maybe there are, do you have any examples of where impunity has been overturned when you, you mentioned that in your talk? I'm sure that's, I don't know what the context of the rest of the question is, but. Um, I don't really understand the question. Um, is it what, where, so what are some examples of, of how uh, sort of the neoliberal ideology yeah. has stopped working where things are moving in the opposite direction? Yeah, they also talked about gender impunity. This okay. gender impunity, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> just question. going backwards. <laughs> um, well, a good example I can think of, um, and you can learn more about this uh, in the um, in the Democracy Collaborative's webinar on community wealth building, is um, Preston in the UK, um, where they basically um, started working at the local level. I'm not an expert on community wealth building. So my colleagues can talk much better about this, but 
But basically their city council decide to adopt this concept of community wealth building. And they started to really invest in their community and disinvest in uh, multinational corporations or large business corporations from the outside. And they started their own local pension fund. Um, they created a city center, which, um, which helped jumpstart a lot of local businesses. And they've done so well at, at expanding their own local economy or their regional economy that they've actually been named the best um, improved economy in, in the UK, I think two or three years in the running. And um, they're the only place during the last election in the UK where uh, labor came in with a tremendous win instead of, instead of the conservatives. And so it turns out that actually building a local community and generating well-being for people within an ecological framework is a really good political strategy, just as it is an economic strategy. You're on mute again. <laughs> Keep forgetting. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, Somebody's asking here, we have seen a lot of austerity for, for the commons and stimulus for the wealthy in the neoliberal era. The pandemic created some space for more broad-based stimulus for lower income levels, at least in the West. What can we learn from the pandemic to change the narrative? Yeah, I think we can learn from the pandemic. Oh, I think we can learn a lot from the pandemic. So I think one of the things that became really clear was that um, we, we actually provided a lot of stimulus for big corporations um, and we didn't hold them to account for anything. We didn't ask them for anything in return. And I think a lot of people saw that very starkly um, for the second time after the 2008 financial collapse. And that has changed a lot of the conversation around what we should be expecting from large corporations and what we should be expecting um, from our government actually in terms of, of taxes and stuff like that. But also the stimulus, you know, it just, it profoundly impacted people. And, and I think also the, the shutting down of the economy really made people, really gave people the opportunity to think about, um, to take a rest and to think about what they want for their lives. Um, a lot of people put that money into savings and started new businesses and decided to go back to school. A lot of people didn't have enough money to do that, but actually were able to stay afloat. And I think it led, it was one of the things that led to the great resignation. So people just saying no, that they don't want to continue on the treadmill of the neoliberal idea. Uh, I think it exposed a lot of the um, disparities in our economic system and in our society in general. And so I think the pandemic has really been sort of a catalyst to, 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 uh, to take these conversations that we've been having about fairness and, and equity and ecology to the next level, uh, which I think has been really beneficial. I think people are they're less willing to settle than they were than they were, and they're looking for new answers to the old problems. Yeah, there is a lot, there is a lot of hope out there and people changing the way they have thought about the whole system for the past 40 years, and, and that, that's very hopeful. I'm gonna ask you a quick question here. Does plural forms of ownership in your model include ownership of natural resources? Yes, it definitely includes, well, it includes ownership of natural resources. That's a really good question, actually, that in my own mind, I haven't figured out the right answer to. Um, I don't know how we construct an ownership system for the planet that's not a private ownership system that actually works to keep us within planetary boundaries. So this is an area that um, I've been exploring and that I don't really have an answer for. So, you know, even an economic system that provides inclusive economic rights to people that puts people above property, 
it's not clear to me how we as a society, as a, as a, as a global society actually can create a system that keeps us within planetary boundaries. This is what keeps me up at night. So hopefully our, our ecological uh, economic system and others can help us solve this problem. I think it's a little easier to do at a local level or a regional level, but at a global level, I think it's really hard. And, and I, I'm still searching for the mechanism for that. And I think, yeah, and I, and I think people can look into Eleanor Ostrom's idea yes. of the commons and yes. that might help um, to understand some of this. And just one last question. There's a lot of good questions and we got to move to the next speaker, but somebody asked here, but one systems thinking be equivalent to intersectional understanding and won't that be an easier way to understand the system, the systemic issues? It's an interesting I think, question. I think systems thinking um, is very similar to an intersectional analysis. Um, what was the second half of that question? Um, basically saying that it will be easier to use intersectional as a framework instead of a, instead of going around talking in systems thinking. I think that's, that's kind of like what they were trying to get that at. Yeah, that might be true. It might be a better way to do it. It's actually, if you think about it, it seems a little bit more manageable. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody as an individual or even as a small group has the ability to see across all systems at the same time. So it really does require um, looking at intersectionality among humans, but also looking across history, across culture, across the environment. So maybe the best way for us to proceed is sort of groups of like intersectionality groups. And, uh, and but I think it is very important. I've, I've done some work on um, what we call um, um, innovation networks. And so when you've got a significantly wicked problem like banks financing fossil fuels, uh, what you do is you bring stakeholders from across that entire system together. They don't normally talk to each other. They often don't even speak the same language or like each other. But if you bring them together to solve the problem, most of them have to agree upon the problem. You can actually make an enormous amount of headway. So for me, that's kind of what systems acting is. Um, and maybe intersectionality is is more like systems acting because you're not just um, thinking or postulating, you're actually on the ground prototyping, trying to figure out what to do and building relationships in the process, which I think is is really critical. Yeah, and I, and I saw that first scan with the fossil fuel investment movement that I have been part of the past decade. And, and a lot of it was, you know, the students had their own their own approach to it, the, we come, and then the, the universities had their own, you know, approach to it, and they were trying to protect the endowments until like a different way, different ways of communicating and understanding the systematic understanding of it led to a lot of them that, to divest. But you know, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I really appreciate having you here, Leslie. You were wonderful. We're having a lot of people saying that they really enjoy your talk. And, Thank you. And we'll see you soon. Um, I will give everyone a, a two-minute break. And uh, well, well, I'll let uh, Inga Rabke, um set up her presentation. Okay, and I'll put more of the resources that I drew from in the chat as well as my email. And if you do, if you would like a copy of the New Systems Reader, just email me, and I'll also put um, the link to our web our webinar next Tuesday in there as well. Right. Thank you, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Rigo, for inviting me. This has been great. You're welcome. Also, I would like to remind everyone that today we don't have a breakout group. We have uh, a panel at the end and uh, for the last hour, which we have emerging scholars uh, joining us and John will be moderating it. So now I guess I'll give the floor to Inga Rapke, who, who is an emeritus professor in ecological economics uh, from Denmark. 
and a really a huge inspiration, honestly. I, I, I can go on and on. A lot of the, the ecological economics for all uh, grounding came from her paper from 2020, which was a, a part of a special issue uh, oh, in the Journal of Ecological Economics uh, titled Econ 101, the need for a sustainability transition. And she, she will, I don't know if she wants to share a, a PowerPoint. If she does, she can go ahead and take, take, take it away. Thank you, Rico. But I think maybe people wanted to have a, a break first before we- sure. We can give them a couple of minutes, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you put it up. Then you will just say when we start again and I'll put the slides on. Yeah, I want 10, uh, I mean, in, in two minutes. I forget you have the Denmark time. <laughs> Everyone has different times, I only want 10. Um, yeah. So we're gonna give people two minutes for break and very happy to have you here. And I just really wanna say thank you so much because I know your son's wife is having a baby soon and Inga is actually very busy these days because she's trying to like help out uh, her family. And so she put this time for us and it just means that she really cares about, um, and she always has, uh, you know, understand, helping to better understand ecological economics, uh, which is a pleasure. Um, so yeah. Oh, so yeah, take it away. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, what I'm going to do is really to uh, go through the paper that uh, Rico was talking about uh, and try to uh, give you some idea about what, what's, what it's all about. Um, it, it sort of starts out with saying that uh, our field ecological economics is just one example within a family of transdisciplinary responses to the environmental and social crisis, and we know a lot of them, political ecology, industrial ecology, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have many shared concerns and, and research areas, but I think that ecological economics has a particular challenge that the others don't have because we have economics in our name. So we really face a particular challenge of contributing to the development of a new economics. Um, and uh, I'm a bit more radical here than uh, many other heterodox economists, because many heterodox economists, including, for instance, the organization of rethinking economics, they ask for pluralism. So they really want to mainstream economists to also present some of the heterodox views. And I think this is very understandable, uh, because you can see heterodox economists as suppressed minorities. But I think that we are in a way too modest here. We should not just stick to pluralism. We actually re, uh, need a new economics. So this is what the paper is about, this need. Uh, and, and one of the arguments that have often been used is that it would make us stronger because you can say, Mainstream economics uh, are relatively, they, they're relatively strong because they have a relatively coherent body of thought as a basis. And uh, heterodox communities do not have the same. Um, we all tend to uh, criticize neoclassical economics in different ways. 
af, for instance, uh, feminist economics uh, takes up gender issues, ecological economics takes up the biophysical basis, the post-Keynesians, they discuss the problem of market clearing and, and many other macroeconomic problems. Institutional economics, they want economics to go beyond individualism and so on and so forth. So each of these heterodox communities have their own separate issues. Um, and we haven't really developed a shared platform, uh, but uh, Edward Fulbrook, as one of the examples, he argues that we should really try to have such a shared platform. Of course, we should still have our specialized fields, but at the same time, it would be really useful if we developed a more shared platform uh, for all of us. Uh, and another argument uh, related also to academic strains is that uh, when we want to challenge the orthodoxy in a situation where there are so many conflicts, we really need more unity, both analytically and organizationally. So we should develop this shared plat platform. But the problem is that this is really contrary to nature because usually various fields, they are branching out. And we have seen that also in ecological economics that uh, we have also branched out into several different fields now, subfields. So um, it's really not so easy to develop such a shared platform. A more political argument for this need of a shared platform is that we have faced such huge challenges and mainstream economics really performs badly in relation to these challenges, the economic and environmental crisis, the social crisis, inequality, and so on. So we need really another approach to perform better for future generations and the poor. Um, this argument relates to what can be called the performativity approach. Um, very often heterodox economists tend to criticize mainstream economics because it misrepresents reality. Um, and there are good reasons for this argument, but this is not really the point because um, economics exists to further a normative agenda. It's not because it's useful in describing the world. So it's actually useful not to be <laughs> describing the world um, in, um, in the <laughs> best way. So um, you can say, uh, you can take this point a step further by arguing that mainstream economics is not only an ideological weapon, but it's also an integral part of shaping the institutional details of economic processes. So it's actually useful for particular interests. So economics performs, shapes and forms the economy rather than observing how it functions. So you can say that economics is not really representing a world that is external to itself. It actually operates within this world. And this is very well illustrated by Donald McKenzie's uh, title of his book on financial models, where he says that uh, these financial models or economics is uh, an engine, not a camera. So it's really active in, active in constructing the economy. So uh, this performativity approach really argues that uh, economics does something in the world. Uh, and an example of this uh, could be when we take this uh, circular flow model, which is basic in, in uh, economics teaching, uh, where we have this uh, circular flow model, and you can say this is a perpetual motion machine that is independent of nature. Um, and uh, obviously this is highly problematic from an ecological economics point of view. Um, and it also focuses on maximizing the yearly flow measured in money. Uh, so uh, furthermore, uh, it also has an obviously ideological message by saying that everybody get what they deserve because each factor of production is paid according to its contribution to production. And then the owner of this factor of production gets the pay. And this way of presenting the world is justifying inequality. 
So uh, again, it's a problematic message that is sent out by the basic model. So the challenge we are facing is really that mainstream thinking permeates the public debate and policy making. All the thought patterns, basic ideas, narratives, and so on uh, that we see in the public debate coming from economics, they are presented as something natural, something that is not to be questioned. Uh, sometimes in, uh, when you discuss or criticize mainstream economics, uh, it is argued that the research front of mainstream economics is actually uh, also taking various uh, critiques into account. But this is not really so important because what is happening is in the mainstream the public debate, uh, the fundamental uh, thinking of mainstream economics is central. So if we really want to challenge this effectively, we need a new basic knowledge structure. So a new basic wiring, you can say. So the question is how to approach this task. And very often heterodox economists, they have done it by uh, making oppositions. So they have formulated their heterodox ideas in opposition to mainstream economics. And what I argue is that we should really go for developing a new economics independently and as a self-contained perspective. So we shouldn't always say, oh, this is mainstream and now we have an opposition to this. We should rather define what we think should be the core ideas of economics. But of course, I realized for people who have already been brainwashed in economics, it's also necessary to be debunk uh, mainstream economics. So for instance, the work by Steve Keen is really very helpful here. But the question here is really, how should we introduce basic economics if neoclassical economics had never been formulated? So this is sort of the, the key question of um, of the paper. And I'll run through some of the arguments here in, in the paper. It's really a kind of a suggestion for a course, you could say. How would we make uh, Econ 101? Um, and then I have also tried to, uh, in, in relation to what Rico suggested, to sort of focus on some of the heterodox strands of thoughts that influence here can be integrated into this account. But it's, it's just a few examples to illustrate what we could do. So if we first take what is economics all about, I think the core topic is really human provisioning. So uh, how do humans make a living? Um, and uh, you can say this subject cannot really be delimited in any ontological sense. It's not as there, but I would rather argue that it, we apply a sort of a cross-cutting perspective on the totality of humans in the biosphere, uh, where uh, economics always involves both biophysical, technical, social, and cultural aspects. So it's really something that sort of cuts across uh, the whole. And this is in a way a critique of the traditional presentation of the embeddedness model where we have the economy embedded in society and society embedded in environment. I think in a way this is a, a misleading model. I would rather argue for this more cross-cutting perspective. I think this is very much related to what is done in feminist economics, for instance, and also in economic anthropology. So that would be some of the families I would point to here. Um, then I think when we teach economics, it's useful to increase the awareness of the basic thought patterns we apply. Very often when we teach, uh, basic thought patterns are not really made explicit, uh, but I suggest that we actually try to make explicit how we think. Uh, and just a few um, words on this, I would say that, uh, for instance, what we would do would be to focus on qualitative change over time and historical specificity. So not always abstractions, but a lot of, of focus on the historical specificity. Uh, 
still I would allow some for some general concepts, for instance, from sociology, uh, structure, actor, interplay, institutions, power issues, and so on. And also a lot of concepts from both evolutionary thinking and system thinking. So we have, I think, some core thought figures about cumulative causation, past dependency, feedback, tipping points, and so on, that are sort of general concepts that inform our way of reasoning. And I think you can find this way of reasoning in some sociology and in institutional economics, innovation economics, uh, transition theory, and, and many others also. If we then go to the substantive issues, I think uh, that uh, ecological economics is really providing the basis for a new economics. It would be the starting point uh, because we explain from, take in from the natural sciences, earth system science, thermodynamics, ecology, understanding humans as animals and, and so on. Um, and uh, here my, uh, experiences that um, uh, since I'm not a natural scientist, uh, I draw on other people's knowledge and uh, I include some new knowledge when I'm aware of it. And uh, I often tell the students that you should never trust me because these uh, sciences, they develop all the time and uh, sometimes they have new insights and uh, uh, we should include them when they come by. Um, and when you have taught for decades, you realize that sometimes you've actually taught people something that later turns out to be wrong. Uh, so it's quite important to, to be aware of that. I think the, the key point also in ecological economics here is to emphasize the importance of energy to explain the three phases of human energy history, the idea of hunter-gatherers, uh, pre-industrial agriculture, and uh, industrialization, and also to understand the thermal industrial revolution, understanding how important fossil fuels are for our productivity. And I think that is very decisive to understand the challenges we, we face today. I'll return to this slide, but just include here um, that when we learn about the industrial revolution, it's often a very misleading study uh, where we learn about the brilliant ideas. Um, here we see James Watt and the brilliant idea of the steam engine, but you really have to zoom out to see the coal and understand that the steam engine could not work without the coal. So it's really the, this thermo-industrial revolution, it's so important to understand uh, the um, in very uh, important quality of energy that fossil fuels have this uh, large work energy and energy density and so on. So it's really very difficult to, to find alternatives. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to this, I think we should also contribute with various metrics to illustrate the growing social metabolism within the biosphere and, and to highlight on equal exchange. So this is where I think ecological economics contributes some fundamental to a, a new economics. And I think when you look at some of the people who have worked with the ideas of a new economics, they increasingly acknowledge this point. For instance, uh, Edward Fulbrook. Then the next part of the course could be this social organization of provisioning, because as I said, economics is really about provisioning. Uh, and uh, here uh, I suggest a set of general questions that can be raised in relation to all human societies. Um, so in all human societies, you can really sort of place what I call the real cake in the middle, uh, arguing that uh, we look at the products and services that are needed uh, for making a living. And then on the one hand, we can look at the processes providing this real cake. On the other hand, the processes that relate to appropriation. So like uh, Mariana Matsukatsu, I like these concepts of making and taking uh, and try to uh, incre increase the, the awareness of uh, that 
these processes differ and uh, we can actually, uh, for instance, appropriate a lot that we have not provided, for instance. Um, but the main point here is, I'll not go through the, the model here, but just argue that it should promote the understanding that no social organization is natural or given. Because you can ask some basic questions to all uh, societies, and you can try to do it uh, for your own society. So if you study your own society as an anthropologist would do, then you can ask all these questions. What natural resources are we using? How are they transformed? What products are provided? What are the social units uh, providing these goods and services or products and services? And what is the division of labor? How is the decision making going on? How is coordination organized? Who gets access to what? And so on. Uh, and uh, also, what does it all mean for uh, natural systems and well being, for working environment, and so on? And I think this is really uh, very close to um, economic anthropology, feminist economics, institutional economics, and so on. They would come up with suggestions that could be used here. Um, the next uh, section could deal with the capitalist institutions. And here, I think really history is very important in, uh, in an economics course, because we should understand again, that the institutions of capitalism are in no way natural. They emerged and how did they emerge? Uh, how did this evolutionary process go on? And this would also make it easier to understand that the institutions are susceptible to change. Um, for instance, property relations, they are really decisive for distribution. So how did they develop uh, through enclosure, for instance, dismantling of the commons? How did rent emerge and so on? And then of course we should introduce markets, but I think the main point to understand here is that uh, markets really depend on the state. You cannot really have markets without a state. Uh, so, uh, and also the political construction of markets is still going on. So we are really changing markets all the time. Uh, and this is heavily influenced politically. So there is really no such thing as a, a free market. And the same goes for the market participants. They also undergo change all the time. And if we look at the dynamics, in capitalism, I think the main uh, characteristics here is that when we compare with previous societies, capitalist economies, they are characterized by reinvesting in more production and in technical change. So we are not just building pyramids and, and so on. We are actually using the surplus for even more production. So in that way, capitalism is very dynamic. It's also inherently unstable, uh, as we know from the double character of wages and for money and uh, how it works. And uh, we should also be aware when we tell the story that it's a worldwide transformation involving geo geopolitics and, and military power. I can see in the list below, I should have included obviously also uh, post Keynesian economics and uh, finance and so on. But here we also have, again, history, Marxist economics, law and economics, market sociology, and so on, would be fields to, to integrate here. And then the social organization of uh, distribution. Uh, again, I would emphasize that appropriation has little to do with the contribution to provisioning. Uh, so we should understand that, uh, well, how did this come about, the historical background? And then uh, I draw on uh, Branko Milalovic's uh, concept of citizen rent, where he argues that uh, uh, what we do, uh, or what is really most important for um, whether you uh, have a lot of access to goods today is really where you live. So it's really where your citizenship is. That's really the most important, uh, that is decisive for how much you have access to. 
When we look at, at modern societies and see what, how do we have access to the real cake, uh, then we have it in different ways, at least three forms here. In, within the households, we have care and conventions determining who gets access to what. Uh, in the, uh, within a country, we have rights as citizens. Um, and finally, uh, the third form is purchasing power in the form of money. And of course, then it's, impossible, it's quite important, how do you acquire money? Um, and we are used to talking about salaries, but what is even more important is the ownership of assets. And the interesting point here is really that ownership in itself does not contribute anything, but still this ownership gives you access to, um, to money. Uh, so I think a key task is really to question rent extraction, unearned income. And this is why I put in this photo of Henry George, because he did a lot to actually question rent e extraction. Um, and we should also emphasize that prices, they serve as distributional mechanism based on inequalities, both globally and, and within nations. So we should not see prices as a good expression of the value of goods and services. Really, you can say that uh, there is no relevant concept of value because there is no common, no relevant common biophysical or social quality uh, that relate to all products and services and could determine what the value is. So this also implies that you cannot really calculate the size of the real cake. It's just a pile of products and services. So we, we are left here without a, a theory of value. In relation to, to this topic, again, I mentioned history and institutional economics, Marxist economics, but I'd also like to emphasize uh, valuation studies as a new field uh, that discusses um, how valuation processes take place in society. So how do we actually put value on, on things? Um, uh, although there is no common concept of value, we have a lot of valuation processes and they are actually quite interesting to try to understand. And then, well, this is just an illustration of uh, what, for instance, uh, studies of critical finance, they illustrate that in a country you can inflate the monetary claims. So even you, you have a certain real cave of goods and services, there's really no limit to how you can inflate the monetary cake. Uh, and uh, when you inflate this cake, for instance, through various uh, financial constructions, then it's really the basis for robbing somebody else. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this distinction between uh, money and, and the real cake is quite important. So then uh, the final uh, topic is this governance issue uh, that I would include in the course as well. Um, first, uh, governance is important to understand as uh, no position from outside. So it's not so that government, for instance, can manage everything. Uh, governance is really performed by many different actors and what they all do is to navigate within complexity based on how they perceive their interests and how they perceive the interplay. Uh, and uh, this, we should try to study these governance uh, processes. Of course, sometimes governance is not always civilized. It can be war and, and uh, and also, for instance, in relation to environmental conflicts, I think many of the studies within ecological economics and political ecology have highlighted how much power and violence is actually involved in, in uh, how things are governed also today. But when it is civilized, uh, I think we should try to avoid applying a rigid means end rationality because um, very often we will have to rethink uh, the ends when we have thought about the means. Uh, so 
we should try to do that uh, in a much more open way and also understand that means and ends uh, hang together and uh, have to be thought about together. Uh, then I argue that uh, when we make decisions, we should not base them on monetary measures, because as I said before, prices are not good expressions of value. So we cannot use monetary measures as a reasonable way to make decisions. We, we need to have deliberation on this. And when we deliberate, we should learn to think in terms of resources and, and not money. So when we ask the question, what can we afford? It's not a question about what can we afford in money terms. It doesn't make sense because we can always construct more money, but we need to think about it in terms of resources. And also following this public monetary money creation can be quite useful for sustainability. For instance, if we want to make sustainability investments and so on, we can also have public deficits and, and so on. Uh, when we think of the measures in government policies, we can apply a broad set and not just stick to, to taxes, but have much broader perspectives on government policies. policies. Uh, and what we need to transform is, for instance, provision systems. And we have to think about provision systems in a global perspective. For instance, when we think about food and how we should transform the food system, it's very important to think about that in, in a global perspective. And then finally, we should socialize rent and try to change property relations uh, so that uh, we can have a sustainability transition that is much more just. Um, and here, I think that uh, we can get a lot of inspiration from transition theory again, because they focus on these provision systems and how to transform them. Also in innovation economics, which is uh, relevant in, in relation to how we develop new technologies and so on. Uh, and post Keynesian macroeconomics is obviously key in relation to uh, some of the government policies and public money creation and so on. And critical finance is important for uh, the issue of how to socialize rent because they have an understanding of how a lot of these inequalities are created. So uh, finally, I'll just uh, make you aware of this uh, website uh, where you can see some of this uh, reasoning, but um, uh, what I would like to would really be to well develop uh, a course along the lines that uh, I've been discussing in this paper, but uh, I haven't succeeded in doing that in, in this uh, website, but at least some of the ideas uh, are there, so, so you can have a, a look at them. So I'll stop there and stop the sharing. So, and leave it to, to you to uh, ask some questions or come, give some comments and, and so on. Thank you so much. You know, you know how much I have been following your work and your paper. And I feel like now we can just put your 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 this presentation up on the website and, and that's it. People can can start developing their curriculums based on it. So I'm really grateful that you were able to participate in this. And I, I would just say we I you know it's a work in progress, the website, but Obviously, there's a lot of what I like about you is that you also criticize aspects that we have considered as norms in ecological economics, you know, even the embeddedness, which is something that I use at the very beginning of the website because of the Eco 101 page, because it's very simple. It's a simplistic way of understanding it. But I think once you move beyond that, maybe you, you people can start looking at this more complex uh, model. But I really appreciate your work. I'm going to start with the questions. Um, you, so when Delin asks, you mentioned Steve King's work, which I understand is largely based on systems modeling. Can you think of any insights he has had about the way the economy works that offers clues for the kind of, of share platform that you say we need? Yeah, they're asking for a specific. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's really great what Steve Keen has been doing in relation to debunking economics, first of all, because what he does is really to 
uh, go back and find the critique of various ideas in mainstream economics that have been explained already many years back, and then they have been forgotten. And now he revives them and explains, for instance, why can you not have supply and demand curves? Why do they not make sense? And, and so on. So this is why I think uh, it's really great for um, uh, yeah, getting, a, uh, getting away from the brainwashing that many of us have been through. Um, so this is really uh, what I think is, is very important. And then of course, he also has a lot of uh, ideas that could be integrated in, in a new platform, for instance, in relation to, to macroeconomics uh, and, and modeling and so on. And I must admit that uh, a lot of his uh, stuff on, on uh, modeling is beyond my understanding, but uh, some of you will be able to understand it. So you should just go ahead and try to learn about it. Yes, uh, I agree. Steve King has a lot of great insights. And last thing I heard from him was that he was running for politics in Australia. So we'll see if he joins the Canberra, the Canberra's government. Uh, mm -hmm. It's incredible. Um, so Wendy is asking, how much agreement, agreement is there among heterodox economics that the goal of the system is provisioning? Is this generally accepted? I'm thinking of Donella Meadows emphasizing the importance of the goal of the system in determining its, its nature. I'm not sure whether everybody would agree on, on that, but I think it would really make uh, good sense. And I think that uh, if you look at uh, some of uh, the work that Steve Fulbrook has been doing, um, he has tried to identify some of the key ideas um, of, uh, that are shared across a number of heterodox communities. And he, I think he actually identifies this as one of the, the things that uh, many people agree on. So I think it would make good sense, although maybe it's not formulated in the same way across these communities. Yeah, I would, I, I would say you're never going to get 100% agreement on anything with anyone. Probably not. I guess you're right there. But I think that uh, it has most explicitly been expressed by feminist economics. Uh, they have they've promoted this idea, um, trying to also use this expression and so on. But I think many people would agree that it, it makes good sense. Yeah, I, and I would just add that we're starting to use this in ecological economics at all with new papers coming out of Leeds, um, trying to like modeling and, and quantifying what, 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 how we can provide, enable these provisioning systems within planetary boundaries. So that's something that is happening. Um, there's another question here. Uh, in the model of provisioning and appropriation, where does our individual energy fall? I mean, the labor energy and activities of individual humans as an input? Interesting question. Yeah. Well, what I do is uh, in a way inspired by practice theory, which I've worked with uh, in relation to consumption issues actually. But you can argue that uh, work processes are kind of practices that integrate uh, you have various uh, well, material resources, energy, and so on, integrate knowledge, integrate infrastructures that we are placed in, uh, and, and it's sort of based on, on uh, our history. Um, and I think that um, uh, in a way, it's not the energy that we eat, for instance, it's not directly visible in the model. I think, I guess this is what the question is really about. I would say it's not directly visible in the model. Uh, it's just visible as an energy input into the work processes and the work processes are then carried out by humans organized in, in various ways. So it's not directly visible in that sense. Yeah. 
I mean, I guess the only issue is that is one of the factors of production, right? That that neoclassical economics now tends to overlook, along with energy, right? Energy being the the primary one to all of them, right? And then is mostly the focus on capital. So we're trying to move beyond that. And I think there are ways that in global economics we can include that. Um, Actually, can, uh, uh, maybe if I can just draw a line back to the previous question, I think this is also a point that Steve Keen in recent years has been uh, stressing quite a lot, this whole issue of um, how you can model energy uh, in, in relation to uh, the economy. And he has been working together with Bob Ayers uh, in recent years. So uh, I think this is really getting also promoted uh, these days, a much, much better understanding of the importance of, of energy. So let's hope we can get also some influence into mainstream. Yes, I mean, the biophysical economist, you know, Charlie Hall, my, my advisor from undergrad, has been working a lot in the United States here. And if people want to learn about biophysical economics, which is very focused on trying to understand these energy flows throughout the system, yeah. that's something that is very important to look at. Uh, so Mika is asking, when we assume that societies have only a limited capacity of knowledge and learning about economics, what will you prioritize in teaching in the new Econ 101? AKA, also known as, what, is should, what should everyone know about it? In the same way everyone knows or has heard about the invisible hand and supply and demand. I'm not quite sure whether I understand the question is, are you uh, asking me what I think should be given priority? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this is really what I've tried to do in the presentation is to say that forget about the invisible hand, forget about focusing on markets in Econ 101, but try to uh, include the stuff that I have sort of presented as the core ideas. And there I sort of emphasize, for instance, um, uh, historical understandings. So understanding why did capitalist institutions actually emerge? How did they come about? I think this is uh, so important to understand that you don't just get these abstractions that can mislead you into thinking that this is sort of natural or can never be changed and so on. So for me, this is really important that, uh, that we focus a lot on, on uh, yeah, past dependency in a way as a, a core issue. Yeah, and I think you, you highlighted some of those aspects by, for example, emphasizing the biophysical aspect that like we were just talking about, it gets ignored and it should be a pillar. And I think people, what they were saying is, we have the invisible hand as the thing that everyone knows, right? From, from neoclassical economics. What would be the equivalent of that new one? And I think you basically said the biophysical foundation, at least if you're gonna yeah. focus on anything, yeah, but I agree and that the biophysical foundation is really the contribution from ecological economics to the new economics. And this is basic. But then we also have to understand how is these social provisioning processes carried out. Uh, and uh, when we try to understand that, we should not have these very abstract uh, models, but we should focus a lot on yeah, historical specificity and uh, uh, global interconnections so that we basically understand that, uh, for instance, in the rich countries, when we have high living standards, some of us, it's at the expense of others. Uh, so we should understand how these processes are, are carried out through unequal exchange and, and power relations and so on. So that is key. <laughs> I think, well, if if I should maybe just say one word <laughs> that is central here, I would say power. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's great. And um, so another person is asking, thank you, so, is saying, is giving a comment and, and, and asking a question. Thank you so much for your really inspiring presentation, especially for highlighting how normative economics really is. I was once told that a key reason for the pervasiveness of neoclassical or neoliberal economics was the active undermining of other economic approaches by the Montpelier Society. 
Does anyone know if this is true? True. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, I think actually it's an important uh, story about this uh, society, uh, and I, I've sometimes also used it in relation to. Uh, well, for instance, you can say when uh, Keynesian economics ran into problems in the late 60s, early 70s, in relation to uh, uh, higher energy prices and, and uh, a number of other issues, um, then it sort of, uh, yeah, it, they, they ran into, into problems. And then in the wings, uh, the Mount Pelerin society, they had developed a different way of thinking and they were ready in the wings and they sort of took over and got a lot of influence in this critical situation. And when we had the financial crisis in 2007, 8 and so on, then we were not ready in the wings. We didn't, we hadn't developed a new economics that was promoted and so on. And obviously you can say it was also much more difficult uh, because we didn't have the money that the, they had because they had a lot of money and, and influence and, and were supported by uh, strong interests that yeah, wanted to change the social compromise that uh, had developed after the Second World War. Uh, so obviously we were in a much more difficult position, but still you can say, well, we, we uh, missed an opportunity uh, by not having developed a, a strong new economics. And yeah, we should be more ready in the wings next time. Yeah, um, and this course is trying, is, is a little, you know, <laughs> attempt at, I laugh at yeah. myself because I really attempt that it has been very difficult to do, but I kind of like get us to, to have a, a cohesive story because I, you know, I believe as I believe that you believe, I mean, your paper says it all, ecological economics is a very important story to tell and it can help inform this, but we still have work to do. And, and, and we need a lot of resources, <laughs> like you say, yeah. to get us ready for the next uh, crisis because we, we, you know, what we're seeing with inflation, for example, that will continue and pro probably there will be a financial crisis if, if they are not regulating the system. Um, somebody's asking here, during the last three days of the course, power is talked about at all times. What is power for the ecological economy? You kind of like answer this, but I'll give you another chance here. Uh, how to use it in the models for a just transition towards a right size economy. So they're asking more specifically, how can we use the power or understand power for the ecological economy and how, how how to model that? I mean, it's hard to model it, but I'll, I'll give you your take. How, how do we think about power for a just transition? Well, that's not an easy question, but if I should suggest a, a theoretical source where we have, I think a good presentation of power issues in relation to ecological economics, I'll suggest the, the book by Ari Varden uh, on institutions the second version of, of the book, uh, where he has uh, a chapter on various sorts of power in relation to institutions. And, and I think what we need to, to is really to understand this broad variety of what is power all about. Um, so there are no, no easy definitions in a way. We need a lot of, of uh, varied understandings of how power actually works. But obviously, uh, it doesn't help us too much with how do we become more powerful and all the people in relation to environmental conflicts and so on. How do they become more powerful? Uh, so that's not easy to respond to. Yeah, it's not easy, but you, you always find a way. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is a question here from a student, I believe. That, that, uh, these are, somebody says, these are awesome elements of an intro to economics course. As you might know, most departments don't offer such holistic, pluralist, and critical introductions to the discipline. But, and I would say historic, right? There, there's no history of economics. But rather, how but rather 
throw students directly into the rigid technicalities of micro and macroeconomics. As a student organizer, I am interested to know how students can best convince or pressure their departments to offer such a course, especially if said departments are predominantly orthodox or even hostile to heterodoxy or um, pluralism. Mm -hmm. this is, I this think that, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I, I think that um, uh, this is really what rethinking economics uh, works with this organization and they don't think that they are powerful enough to suggest to have uh, teaching in a new economics. So this is why they always ask for pluralism. So they use a sort of a democratic language, say it's very wrong that you are suppressing all these minorities, they should also have a word. Uh, and therefore they have made uh, a publication, for instance, where they have included a number of heterodox schools, including ecological economics, uh, that are presented, and then this can be used as a sort of extra source uh, that you can um, use as a supplement in relation to, to mainstream teaching. And this is basically working with the oppositions, as I said, and with the critique of the mainstream and with the debunking and so on, but not so much about how do we formulate a new platform. Um, but it's better than nothing. Uh, so uh, I think it's very understandable that, uh, that this is done and I'm not against it in any way. I'm just arguing that we should add this extra step of working with a new economics, and then you will have to do it in your spare time, uh, trying to, to understand this. I think this was really, well, when I was young in the 1970s, uh, you can say the, the critical thinking in Europe was Marxist economics. So we studied Marxist economics in the spare time and tried to, uh, get some of this stuff into, um, into the ordinary teaching and so on. But uh, obviously we were not that successful. No, and I, and I, and I you know, I am, I am with the Rethinking Economics groups and, and there's a massive effort to, to expand that in the United States as it has really worked in Europe. I mean, it has been expanded in Europe. Uh, and I think part of the, the thinking of having the Ecological Economics for All initiative is to provide them a medium where there's still a lot of work to do and even to follow your paper. There's a lot of work. And I need you to one day, please, this is like a public ask, give us feedback on the, on the, on the website when, when you have time in the future. It will be massively important because we see it as an open source uh, textbook that is hopefully interactive and, and has different ways of learning. So it is, it, 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 you know, um, what is uh, um, the exploring economics? I'm thinking exploring economics has a, a good website too to learn about the different heterodox schools, but it's still very silo. So our goal is how do we draw from them? Like you are writing on your paper, and you give on each on each slide, you gave examples of how we can learn or inform from the different and draw from the different heterodox schools to to inform every single aspect that you think should be in an Eco 101 text. So we'll see what happens, but uh, we're all proud of the fight. And, and, I will, and I will probably end it here, uh, unless you have one last comment. We will like, I give you the last word. Inga. Well, I'm happy uh, to have this chance to uh, promote the ideas. And uh, I congratulate you with uh, working with this teaching activity. I think it's it's really good. So uh, I wish you all the best for, for the course. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna join everyone. I'm, sure I'm gonna be clapping and behind the scenes, but thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. So, I'm gonna turn it now to John Erickson, who's gonna be moderating the panel uh, discussion. And John, take it away. Great, thank you, Rigo. Um, should we take just a couple minute break? 
Yes, you're in charge now. Okay, I'm in charge now. Wow, jeez. All right, why don't we take a two-minute break, and then we have, um, I, I realize it's not described on the website, but we do have a panel of uh, three emerging scholars early in their careers in ecological economics, and uh, we'll have a chat with them and have some time for more, more Q&A with you all. So let's take uh, three minutes. It's 2.02 .02 Eastern time by my clock. We'll come back in three minutes. Okay, folks, I'll invite my, our panelists to turn their videos on and we'll get started. Um, if you weren't with us on Thursday of last week, um, where I had an opportunity to give a talk, my name is John Erickson. I'm on the faculty at the University of Vermont. And together with Josh Farley, we've been supporting this uh, ecological economics effort at the University of Vermont for, uh, well, 20 years now. Um, so we have a, a wonderful opportunity now to really speak to the emerging scholars, the future leaders, the folks early in their career who are helping to shape exactly what we're talking about in this course. Um, so I wanna introduce our three panelists. Um, we've got a kind of few questions to warm up with related to today's, today's themes on systems thinking and heterodox economics and, and kind of in general how to build this movement together. Um, and then we'll again, open it up to some questions and answers to everyone who's still with us on the course. So uh, please keep the discussions going in the chat box, but most importantly, put your questions into the Q and A box if you wouldn't mind. So let me introduce our panelists and then we're gonna 
dive right in. So we have with us today, Tina Beji. Uh, Tina, I hope I'm saying your last name right. Um, Tina is a PhD candidate at McGill University in Quebec, Canada, uh, and a member of the Leadership for the Ecozoic program that we've referred to a few times uh, through this course, the program that, that Rigo is part of. She previously worked as an environmental engineer in the Arctic to evaluate the ecological impact of the mining industry in vulnerable regions to climate variability. Her research interests fall in the boundary waters of political ecology and world systems theory. And her current research focuses on the critique of so-called sustainable technologies through this lens of ecological economics. We also have with us Martin Sears. Martin is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Integrated Energy Systems at the University of Victoria, which is in British Columbia, Canada. Martin uh, is one of the graduates of our, of our partnerships. He completed his PhD at York University in Ontario, Canada, as a member of the Economics for the Anthropocene program, which was a kind of precursor to the leadership for the Ecozoic Partnership. He is interested in new approaches to the study of macroeconomics that considers both the physical and financial system dimensions of economic activity, and how these might be studied together. His research interest is in the relatively new approach to macroeconomics called ecological macroeconomics, and specifically in the derivation of stock flow consistent input output models, uh, an area where I've done some research myself. And then of course, you've all got to know along the way, Rigo Melgar Melgar. Rigo is also a PhD candidate uh, along with Tina in the Leadership for the Ecozoic Program. Um, Tina is based out of McGill. Rigo is here at the University of Vermont in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources and is also one of our uh, very active Gund graduate fellows at the Gund Institute for Environment. His research is broadly focused on the socio-ecological implication of a just energy transition in the United States. More specifically, his work for the last couple of years to understand the socio-ecological implications of coevolution of the U.S. financial system for this transition, drawing from systems thinking and the social and biological foundations of ecological economics and other heterodox economics schools. So as you can see, we have three very talented um, colleagues with us today who are at the early stages of their career and helping us shape this field and other fields in heterodox economics. So maybe I'll start with our graduate. <laughs> of the Economics for the Anthropocene program, Martin. Um, I'd love to hear just a bit uh, of your reflection on what, what drew you into this Economics for the Anthropocene partnership, maybe some of the highlights of this approach and uh, how this has shaped your, your research and your early career now that you're a postdoc out on the West Coast. Take it away, Martin. Sure, well, I'll try not to ramble too long, but I was thinking this morning how to answer this question and just kind of, as to what drew me here, this kind of three answers. When you're an econ undergrad back in 2012, you realize you're learning a lot of math to formalize an ideology. And that was a pretty, pretty wretched experience. So this journey started with a pretty significant dose of physics envy. Um, and it was only really as kind of a you know, overworked consultant in 2015, that the question of why things were moving so quickly, why I had to work laborious long hours, why anything happened the way it did, uh, really kind of formalized in my brain and put those two things together. I learned a version of economics that, you know, was just maintaining an ideology. And then I'd gone out into the real world and I noted that it operated more or less the way it said, and I really didn't like it. So I kind of came to ecological economics as someone who didn't have many answers and lots of questions. And what attracted me to E4A was the kind of the strong premise of we're going to do economics as if the physical sciences mattered, first of all, which really attracted me, and as if all the other things that economists do not study in their undergraduate degrees or in their graduate degrees matter. And I kind of can't express how revelatory that was as a notion to me. All these other domains of knowledge for which I had learned basically nothing of are quite important and we can learn when we finally bring them into the fold. The highlights of the program, I mean, there's kind of two. One of them is it's a community. One thing that one tends to lack in graduate school is a community of your peers in many cases. And quite honestly, one of the great highlights of the program was to work 
in a very close knit small group of scholars uh, uh, in North America. And quite honestly, I've developed both great friends and colleagues over that time. But also it really introduced me to a variety of issues. I had no knowledge going into E4A of anything from electrical engineering, power systems theory, sociology, anthropology, none of these things were known to me going in. So E4A managed to do, I mean, two rather remarkable things. It both supplied that community that we so much desire while really making me branch out as a scholar to study things I never ever would have encountered. Oh, searching for my unmute button. Thank you. So thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, part of the motivation for creating this partnership was to create the community that you mentioned and finding that there are lots of people doing this work, but they tend to be very isolated, right? Scattered across the world. So what would it take to maybe bring together, in this case, a handful of universities and a bunch of partners and a bunch of scholars to sort of do something that has uh, more momentum, if you will. Um, let's turn to Tina. Um, Tina, on, on the topic of today's themes, um, I, I, I wanna ask, to get things started with you, what, what motivates you to use um, systems thinking? How do, you, how do you define systems thinking and, and heterodox economics in, in your work? Um, how does heterodox economics apply to your work? And where do these kind of two themes for today's um, discussion overlap? Sounds good. Um, should I mention something about my engagement with L4E first? Sure, or? sure, please do. Okay, okay perfect. Um, well, I kind of have, um, along with uh, many other colleagues in L4E, E4A, um, the same kind of journey of um, the looking for some kind of uh, emancipation in knowledge. Uh, as you said in your introduction, I was working in the mining and uh, um, which is, uh, I would say, one of the dirtiest industries uh, around the world and uh, mostly in Canada. And um, so obver observing firsthand um, environmental degradation because I was working in the Arctic and in this pristine um, um, region, uh, I was looking for um, uh, ways to making meaningful contribution to a new pattern of human habituation that uh, doesn't necessarily destroy the nature, destroy the uh, community of life, but support it. And uh, I was also um, uh, digging uh, at the time in um, political economy. Um, and when I uh, realized, I basically wanted to be part of a team that intends to communicate and animate a sort of um, cultural or particularly economic revisioning because um, working in nature, seeing its destruction, and then um, looking at political economy and seeing, it, uh, seeing economy as a culprit. Um, so what I, uh, when I first um, figured out uh, the discipline of ecological economics, I was quite excited because uh, things that I was looking for was quite epitomized in this field. And, uh, and more than that, when I realized that there is a, a group in Canada in my vicinity in Montreal looking at uh, E4A, looking at ecological economics. Um, and uh, when I realized that their central theory of change um, resonates uh, perfectly with my, uh, well, let's say academic ambitions at the time. Um, um, and uh, I, I was quite excited to join and um, uh, and the, you know their purpose in establishing an educational based project that trains uh, emerging scholars or those that they want to be trained in discipline uh, towards um, because uh, first we had a 4 a which was, which was uh, economic for the Anthropocene and then later on um, this new program that we uh, we and that uh, me and Rico are um, part our part of is um, um, envisioning a transition to um, an era of ecozoic, which basically we call it an, an era of mutually enhancing human and um, uh, ecosphere relationship. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I joined the program and uh, 
uh, me, Rigo, Erlang, uh, many of our uh, creative colleagues. Um, we had a paper that talks about higher education that, I'm, um, that I think worth knowing for uh, students uh, that are looking at education as the center of our economic change. Um, uh, to know about this paper, I think Rigo perhaps would talk about it more. Um, um so about your uh if i if I can continue on yeah yeah please yeah how, how systems thinking and heterodox economics really features in your work yeah okay yeah. uh well in my work I, I give just a little bit of explanation about my um my work uh so we are um Encountering recent global excitement about uh, this curbing emission through electrification of transportation, and I'm sure many of you guys heard about it, uh, that has trickled down to more than 20 cities pledging to ban uh, petrol and diesel cars, uh, combustion engine cars, by 2030, or um, in some other countries and cities in, by 2050. But where I live in Quebec, we also have a, um, a new policy that's called uh, Quebec Sustainable Mobility that is ambitiously looking at uh, 2050 to have a complete electric battery ecosystem. Um, so um, when I first heard about that um, and um, looking for a, a, a project, <laughs> And uh, it was it was quite interesting because Quebec has uh, at a natural endowment of uh, strategic mineral uh, minerals, lithium, etc., that can uh, capitalize on. And and uh, more than that, we have hydroelectricity that is quite uh, like now more than 90% of Quebec energy consumption is coming from uh, this renewable energy hydroelectricity. Uh, but then, um, so that's a great policy, but um, what is paradoxical in our era is this uh, in our, let's say last few decades is that the more policies and organizations aim to tackle the environmental calamities, the more these uh, environmental institutions have become sophisticated, the more our environment continues to go downhill. So um, we're hearing uh, a lot about Donella Meadows uh, and other scholars uh, urging us to look, to dig into the uh, root cause, especially in the, in the you know, 70s, 80s, uh, to the root cause of these environmental declines and, um, and um, seeking basically fundamental systemic changes rather than uh, you know, being co-opted in this prevailing system of political economy. So um, most of us ignore that. Uh, I mean, uh, ignore the systemic perspective. Um, and uh, we created new laws, with new policies with no large environmental gain. So, um, now, time and again, we're, what we are seeing is uh, we, we're basically doing the same thing through sustainable policies and new technologies that signify um, uh, the same uh, mantra of growth. So, uh, one of these, uh, one of the examples, I would um, it's um, mm, it's a bit uh, provocative, but I think one of these examples is electric vehicle and uh, and basically what I'm investigating into, it, which is this sustainable mobility plans. Um, so coming back to your question, I think uh, our um, the, the problems that we're, uh, we're looking uh, we're basically uh, trying to look at and trying to investigate these contemporary larger scale urban problems um, are often interlinked, they are value ridden, they are circular, uh, and uh, as uh, um, Engie, I think, uh, Inga um, mentioned, they are quite historical and contextual. So um, 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 I, I, I thought we're looking at this very complex problem of transportation and electrification of it. Um, system thinking and heterodox economic uh, would be quite helpful. 
because we're looking at um, systems that um, they, uh, they, they, they in compose of a web of synergies and trade-offs with multiple possible solutions. Uh, so we need a, um, a heterodoxity, we need a system thinking, a critical system thinking while looking at them. So that's one of the reasons, um, uh, or one of the way that I applied uh, heterodox economic and system thinking into my work. Great, great. That's, that's such a good example. So transportation and the infrastructure and the, the shift to electric vehicles. And it got Scott, many of us asking, are we taking one step forward to take two steps back, right? So I think coming at it from a systems point of view will, will be very helpful. Um, all right, Rigo, the mastermind behind this course and the e for all website. Um, we get to put you on the spot now. Um, so you're also a PhD candidate in this l 3 program, Leadership with the Ecozoic. And uh, I know you're thinking a lot about the intersection of finance, the economy and environment. Um, why do you think we need a more uh, systems thinking approach to our economy? What, what does that look for you like for you? How does it how does it intersect with your own work? You're always quote, quoting Donato Meadows, so now's your chance. Um. First of all, thank you so much to the panelists who are joining us here. Yeah, I know you guys put in time up for your day to do this, and I really appreciate that. And also to appreciate to have Tina in, in our team. She's part of the e for all team, and she's very excited about working with us. And I, I believe Martin will be too at some point. Uh, so yeah, this question, how do we, uh, why do we need to use systems thinking to address our political economy crisis, whether it's social and climate crisis, uh, what I can give you is an example. First, I would like to ask anyone who is from Europe to please write on the chat how inflation is impacting you. Let us know what's going on in Europe, how that is impacting you. And then what it, get, it gets me thinking is, I was just been re reading in the last couple of days, is how Germany had planned to phase out its nuclear plants um, coming up in the next, I believe next year. And now they are being confronted with this terrible energy crisis in Europe because of, you know, the, they got used to cheap gas from Russia. And so how do we, the reason why I'm giving that example is because you got to really think systematically, right? What are the options for Germany? Germany got to phase out nuclear energy and then replace it with what? With coal, which is what they, they are, I, I read to their reopening coal plants. Why is that happening? Because the system is, is trying to, the, the economic superorganism in the case of Europe, Germany being the largest economy, is trying to perpetuate itself and is using, and it needs cheap energy, right? So thinking in systems will lead you to understand that if you shut down your, your nuclear plants, the system will be inclined to find the one with the, with the highest energy return investment, meaning the cheapest energy source. So you're gonna be probably replacing it with coal and or natural gas but now they don't have natural gas for really and not only that but in germany lignite they have lignite coal reserves which are the least quality coal reserves in the world so you're gonna get you're gonna have to do a lot of extraction to to get uh, some output out of it so it's, it's just in general but i'm just giving you that example to, to understand where i'm coming from here this is impacting europe heavily right now creating massive disruptions inflation impacting the poorest. So if you, when you think about systems, you will know that these decisions of a, a just energy transition cannot just be siloed, cannot be like one thing or the other. You have to think about it systematically. In the United States, people are not really doing that. They think that one fix here and there is gonna, is gonna address the, the problem. It has to be holistic in all different ways. So to give you <laughs> a simple answer, I don't know, I could go on, but. <laughs> Well, that's, that's great. And, and it's certainly um, in teaching systems thinking, I, I often hear from my own students, you know, it, there's this sort of combination of empowering, a power empowerment of thinking in systems, but also a feeling like, well, everything's connected. There's nothing I can do, right? But there's also this feeling of being overwhelmed. And Martin, I've learned so much from you on the biophysical basis of the economy and extending that kind of, that sort of foundational piece to ecological economics. And, and, I, and I wonder how you sort of weave that, you know, the thread between empowerment and uh, hopelessness, right? And, and thinking in systems. How do you sort of, you have such a rich understanding of the 
biophysical basis of the economy. Um, how have you used that in various heterodox approaches and systems thinking in general to move the dial? That's a really great question because I have been struggling uh, very recently with what I might describe as the crushing realization of the complexity of things. Uh, <laughs> I like just as the last few days speaking with some friends in Vancouver about it. Uh, yeah, it, it's very real. There, there, there's only so much you can know as one person. And take any two systems you want. Take, let's say, the electric power system and then take, oh, I don't know, the tech sector, right? These things just interact in ways, as we all know, in you know, ways you don't necessarily predict. You don't understand the vagaries of either system. Yeah, it does, it does become deeply complex. One thing I have learned, I think one thing that systems thinking has sort of taught me is that as the individual, you have to embrace knowing <laughs> very little about a lot of things and trying to knit something together from these disparate elements. But because these things are beyond the capacity of any one of us really to hold, you have to work in teams. So I've gone from math to econ to environmental studies now to uh, engineering, civil engineering department. And one thing that's become vitally clear to me is that I cannot do this work really on my own. I can do the basics of this work on my own. I can address very specific, sometimes arcane problems, but the whole of the problem, or even a part of the problem that is uh, you know, worth grabbing onto requires working beyond just the individual. And academia is a bit funny in that sense because it often does kind of prioritize the role of the individual researcher, but this I've found to be uh, not really all that useful. So in the face of that kind of overwhelming complexity that when you have all these disparate domains that you can't possibly have expertise in all of them what you need to do is branch out and, and work more broadly that makes any sense as an answer to your question no it does and i think that's part of the empowering of understanding that it's all connected um and that we need more people not less at the table and my training in economics was all about narrowing right about becoming an expert about drilling deeper and deeper and deeper on one one thing so that you know more and more and more about less and less and less until you know nothing about anything or something like that right uh so the heterodox approach is is empowering but it's, it's challenging as well as, as our last speaker talked about um let me tina let me bounce back to you about about you, you said you, you're drawn to this program because of the multiple voices and multiple perspectives and the kind of ability to work in teams on problems. Um, what, what specific heterodox approaches have been most useful for you, for example, in the study of electric, electric vehicles? Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, my project, Electric Vehicles and Sustainable Mobility in Quebec, um, I try to... Um, um, obviously, like I'm looking at it from a uh, ecological economic lens. So uh, th that's for uh, the part of heterodox economics, but also um, look at it from a complexity economics, uh, economic um, perspective. So in terms of um, ecological economics, um, I would say uh, we all know that all these um, uh, the material that goes to uh, such a great scale sustainability through um, electric vehicle that we are uh, aiming for. Uh, so ecological economics um, helps us to understand, or at least uh, me at a, at a bigger scale, uh, helps me to understand the, the failure to account for the depletion of these thermodynamic sources, the minerals, and uh, later on the waste that goes to the sink capacity, that basically overwhelms the sink capacity is uh, quite crucial. And um, so if everyone in this planet or, or just global north will go uh, to, a, to have a mass uptake of electric vehicles, uh, what would be the dire implication resulting from this soaring mineral demands uh, to produce lithium batteries? Um, so ecological economics helps us uh, to, um, to understand that you know, it not only exacerbates the source and sink capacity, uh, but also um, creates an, a scarcity issue that uh, touches on uh, allocation and distribution. That is another, two, another very two important pillars of ecological economics. So um, 
many scholars um, have concluded that if rare metal, such as lithium, copper, etc., um, if out of necessity we have to extract the low-grade um, ores of these rare metals, energy return per investment, EROI, that uh, many of ecological economists and perhaps the students of econ economics are um, uh, familiar with, decreased to the point that the renewable energy, uh, such as um, wind turbines, um, solar panels, um, would still be worth producing to a higher, um, higher degree of uh, break even point. So, why would we? put the, uh, the, the, uh, the mineral that we are encountering, the scarcity of them into uh, the massive electric, uh, you know, uh, electrification of transportation, uh, which makes no sense while we need uh, renewable energy in terms of uh, the uh, mass scale uh, transition. So that, that touches upon the um, um, allocation issue that Herman Daly has pointed out as one of the pillars of ecological economics. And on the other hand, we have, um, uh, so uh, many of these countries in the global north that to meet their, uh, to meet their rapidly approaching deadline for their tra transportation plans targets that, uh, as I mentioned, there are more than 20 cities that uh, are planning for this. And Quebec is one of the um, province of Quebec is one of them. Um, to meet this uh, deadline, they may, so many of them are not rich in minerals and they have to import from uh, the, their minerals from rich peripheries, rich in terms of minerals. Uh, so that um, so that that helps us um, to reconceptualize energy technologies in in uh, in this case as a social instrument of environmental load displacement. So um, coming back to system thinking um, here um, again, um, there are many. Uh, let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quite uh, interested in world system thinking, uh, world system theory that has a, a, the geopolitical and bigger system thinking that uh, many of the scholars in this, um, in this uh, that they uh, advocate for this theory, they argue that we are involved in a constant process of uh, unequal, uh, ecological unequal exchange that was also mentioned in this course before, which a majority of the world extract and export their material wealth in order to upheld uh, this privilege uh, for wealthy minorities. So basically the material flow that will go, uh, this um, flow of mineral and rare earth that will go from the uh, peripheries to the global north. Uh, so that's, that's an, uh, another, um, touches upon uh, just distribution and uh, and and also the, the problem of scale in ecological economics I would say so that that that's the way that I uh, they wrap ahead, wrap my head around this project looking at uh, the the system within which um, Quebec is embedded and the, the type of policies that would uh, Quebec along many other cities uh, that would um, choose for transportation and electrification of transportation um, is and uh, is important while we're looking at the, the bigger system and we're looking and heterodox economic and in, in this case ecological economics helps me to uh, basically conceptualize these and um, just the last point that of course ecological economics as uh, Martin is quite expert in that is well equipped with um, socio metabolic analysis, environmentally extended input and output, uh, material flow analysis, etc., will also help. Um, uh, at least um, in this project, it helps me to check out like the um, the material flow that comes from these peripheries to the wealthy countries. Excellent, excellent. Ah, wow, all things. None of these things I learned in grad school. <laughs> you all are so lucky. Um, the energetic basis of the economy, uh, technology as this sort of socially contingent thing, right? 
um, the, the sort of social metabolism of it all, um, you know, we learned that there's like this arrow pointing to the economic box called technology. And there's like one loop back, which is called capital investment. And, and that's it. It's just like manna from heaven. But um, how you're describing that kind of social characteristics and the social contingencies and the path dependency of technology is absolutely critical to this new vision of economics. So thank you. Um, let me ask uh, Rigo one more question, then I'll, I'll turn to you all. Um, I've got just one or two questions in the Q&A box. So if you've got some more questions for our panelists, please put them in there. I'm trying to keep track of the chat as well. God, Rigo, how have you been doing this? It's <laughs> just like multitasking. Um, but let, me, let me come back to Rigo and, uh, and then we'll turn to some of your questions. Um, Rigo, you, you, you've been behind working with your colleagues on this e for all website and really trying to boil down this new story, if you will, to a few key talking points. Uh, perhaps drawing on these various heterodox approaches, including, including ecological economics. Um, what, what are some of the, the, the talking points that you'd like to see? In, uh, as Senge was saying, let's teach from like a position of strength. Like, let's not talk about economics, then the critique, then finally get to ecological economics. Let's just lead with the kind of economics that we want. What would that be in your mind? Just go to the page, eco one. <laughs> I'm joking, but uh, well, we've been trying to brainstorm this as we go. All of us are very busy and it's still a work in progress. And I know as more of us have more time to, to have inputs that that page will be strengthened. But basically is trying to follow that paper by, by Robke and, and to draw from heterodox economics because there is so many different aspects like you read in the description for today, for example. You can draw from behavioral economics to nudge behavior. You can draw from institutional economics to change the goals of the system, right? With institutions are driving a lot of the, the system today. So yeah, the hope is to provide a bit, the very minimum, a biophysical foundation that usually you don't get in most other places. And, and then the social foundation that we need to understand how we can culturally change the system and, and adapt it to, 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 to shift, to try to, I, I call this, try to contain the, maybe that's the next paper, try to contain the economic superorganism. You cannot completely stop it because we, we are in this, you know, almost 8 billion population around the world. We gotta find a way to provision the, the essentials to all of them. How do we do that? How do we inform doing that from an ecological economics perspective? I think that will be an important aspect of, of, of the website, but yeah, providing the biophysical foundation, the social foundation um, to understand that and, and to really think critically about how we can um, e implement ecological economics and, and, and ultimately the, the, the word sufficiency is key because I, when I was talking about the, the issue with, uh, with Germany and, and the nuclear energy, I was not saying that we need more nuclear energy. I was just saying that that is a concentrated source of energy that provides a stable and it's already built for Germany. So if you shut it down and you replace it with coal, you kind of like uh, shooting yourself on the foot with, with your climate targets. But what we need to do in general is have a sufficiency based policy. And from there, you should be building to, to achieve whatever changes you need to provide uh, social equity and an ecologically sustainable society. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're getting some, some questions, a couple that maybe I'll combine together around uh, career paths, since you all are young scholars and, and uh, striking out in this, um, these heterodox areas. Uh, we've got a question about you know, having made this move to ecological economics, uh, what would you expect will happen in the coming job market, private sector, public sector, sector? And then a related question on, on what would you recommend now in your shoes um, to young professionals who want to dedicate their career to systems change and nature protection. Any, any thoughts on that, Martin? Can we want to tee it up with you again and we'll go back around? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very blunt in my assessment with this. So if you enter into academia looking specifically to find an ecological economics tenure track job, the probability of that, at least in North America, is not high. However, the skill set is fantastically useful if you just expand your horizons even slightly. So for example, I will be joining Statistics Canada shortly uh, to work on um, circular economy and 
uh, their energy and environmental flow divisions. The skill set, the thinking, the kind of mind expanding problem solving that you have to approach is it's just desirable and you know immensely practical in many areas. So career paths are a bit of an interesting one. If you follow the kind of traditional logic, I do not know how, shall I say, successful that would be, but the, so many problems, there's so much desire for input on these problems, there's so much desire for even the kind of basic technical skills, thinking about energy, thinking about climate flows, what have you, that demand for it's quite high. So yeah, I'd say the traditional uh, PhD to academic position is probably slow because there's a great deal of inertial inertia in the academic system. Uh, but there's just major hunger for this type of stuff out there, I, as I can attest to from a very small amount of time on the job market. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Certainly, even on undergrads at the University of Vermont studying these areas are, are finding some great opportunities. Leslie, you introduced yourself as a journalist, and I, I think there's a real hunger for people who can connect the dots, right? Who can pull the experts who can solve problems who can work with stakeholders can work with within the context of more deliberative processes to come up with solutions um tina do you want to reflect on your sort of draw into this field and kind of what your prospects look like what you're thinking of doing is it too early to say um yeah it's it maybe a little bit too early but um what i can also add to what martin said um the skill set is quite important. I know Angie um, at, at some point mentioned that okay, one of the, or in her um, paper mentioned that um, it's one of the weakness of uh, the heterodox economics is to be not in the same plate, although they have like very substantial points that they share. Uh, for example, you know, institutional economics is uh, concerned with, uh, you know, go beyond individualism, behavioral economics, looking at, you know, the evolutionary behavior of human and its connection to economics and feminists look at, you know, let's say, unpaid sectors and ecological economics is in, involved with biophysical um, capacities. But, uh, well, if if we go through, um, I think I still think that ecological economics has done a good job to bring all these heterodox economics into, uh, let's say, not under one flag, but at least has um, has insights into the, each of them. And I think uh, ecology, like us, that like uh, me, Rigo, and other uh, of our colleagues, they would be basically coming from very different backgrounds. But this and the, the the common knowledge of ecological economics will give us a skill set that if some of us is coming from law and may go back to law, me coming from engineering that I'll go back to my uh, my own domain, etc. Uh, we may uh, find this skill set um, uh, quite. Uh, um, I mean, I don't want to reduce it to just like being inspiring, but might have like very interesting applications. So we, we from E4A, uh, I think one of us went to, um, he's working in Central Bank of uh, France. And, uh, and uh, a paper that he wrote was quite, um, uh, it, 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 uh, attra uh, attractions. And um, so I think these are these are very promising uh, for us to uh, to follow the same path. And wherever we end up in academia or um, somewhere else, to to you know, to have the same the, the ecological economics gaze in our work. Um, um, yeah, I just on here. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, you know, we, you all have been a part of a very purposeful attempt to change how we do PhD training. Now, that's just one entry point, right? And, and, and thus far, we've had 70 plus PhD students in these two partnerships. But the hope is, I mean, that's kind of a slow wave change, right? That people get into directorships and to new chairs of new departments and run NGOs and work for the government, right? But I think there's lots of entry points in K through 12 education, bachelor's degrees programs, civil society working. So it's all about these kinds of new partnerships for a new economy. And we're getting some questions around that kind of new economy. And we've been working with this throughout the last few days, themes like degrowth, right? Or centering justice, um, 
or, or telling a new, a new cultural story. Um, I find that each new generation of students that I teach is more and more primed for getting off the current train and onto something new. Do you find that as well? Folks who are your age, who you work with, that, who are your colleagues, maybe who've never heard of ecological economics, but they're hungry for this social shift. Um, what, what one question is asking around, you know, what would it take to bring a large component of society together around these themes? Um, Rico, do you want to want to comment on that? That easy, very easy question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's a matter of how do we communicate these things. At the end of the day, um, ecological economics has done has done a lot of work for decades. And it's something that I, I it's like a, I'm like, it sounds like a broken record, I'm saying this. And a lot of it has been, has been about almost like talking within academic circles so that the, it's almost like a same psych, recycling of information. And it, it, what we need to really figure out moving forward is how do we communicate this in a way that, that matters to people in a way that is, is not just completely jargon written but that it helps people give them hope and a structure to understand what's going on. A lot of people are just trying to make ends meet every single day. They wake up and this is an issue with environmentalism in general, right? That people care about the environment and everything, but they are trying to, you know, survive every day. The majority of the population around the world. So to get a masses, the massive amounts of people you need to have leaders, I think, and know how to understand systems thinking, and then, and, then, and, then, and then from that, convey that to the population. So we have work to do with, 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 with doing that. And, and hopefully the people who are joining our, our, our course here are, are, are getting these seeds. You know, this, we're trying to plant these seeds in you so you can carry on in understanding what the hell is going on <laughs> if you blunt with you. So you can go and, 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 and show this to others. And, and hopefully that way we can continue to spread the information, but we require a lot of new communication. Communication, learning how to communicate things in different ways besides academic ways is the key to, to achieve those goals of, of mass uh, of mobilization, uh, which is what you write in your book, uh, John, which is we need to create, it's like rethinking economics. But not just in the in academic circles. Yes, we need more classes on, on heterodox economics and ecological economics. But we need to move beyond that to work with with other um, entities beyond. Academia. Yeah, yeah, we're talking nothing short of mass mobilization. And um, and there's a question in the Q and A that relates to the that this course has that we've heard a lot about the role of the global north. In, in building an ecological economics. And uh, this colleague is interested to know about what you all think about the role of other regions, right? In Latin America, um, in, in Asian countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we've got, a, it's incredible to see the global participation in this course. And, and maybe we're at fault for telling a kind of more Western narrative to sort of confront a Western narrative, but I wonder how you all would reflect on the need for or the role of institutions, actors, players, um, citizens outside of the global North to take this movement on. Um, I'll just open that up generally. I'm not sure who wants to tackle that question. There you go, you're still on. Do you want to dive in? I know, I know when you first came to the program, there was a lot of your colleagues who were talking about degrowth. And, and maybe I'm incorrect in characterizing you this way, but um, you, you, you had some un, uncomfortableness it, with, with well, that, this lacking the, the Latin American perspective. Well, I would, I would just say this. Um, there's a lot of people who are already struggling with limits to growth. Like I was just saying, people are trying to make ends meet. And yes, we need to have degrowth of, of energy and material consumption beyond our some in the essential, you know, to meet the essential needs of, of, of our system. So it's an important concept, and we must continue to, to work towards understanding that. But I believe if, if you walk up to someone, let's say to my 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 nephew who is 18 years old, and he's about to graduate from high school, and I go, you need to degrow, right? It just doesn't work like that. So how do we create a communication strategy that is more generalizable, if you will, 
for the global north, I think degrowth works very well because there's a lot of, of, of waste uh, in the systems. And I do understand clearly that the degrowing the North means that so we can have more resources to redistribute to the rest of the world. Just to give you an example, a big problem that we have in the United States is that 30 to 40% of the food is thrown in the garbage that is produced in this country. It's a massive waste that, and then you have people in Africa, in Latin America, in, in Asia, around the world, and within the United States who don't have uh, access to that essential need, right? Is all the basic energetic needs of any human system, any human being. And um, so we got to tackle that. We got to really address that issue. And, and I think, um, so that, that's, what, that's what I think about when I think about degrowth. We got to understand that is about meeting the, need, the essential needs of everyone in a way that is sufficient uh, with, with, with the concept of sufficiency. Yeah. And how do we communicate that is the key. You know, so we don't create confusion and 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 so on. But degrowth is like an extremely important concept, and and it has to be continued to to be developed. Tina, I wonder if, if you want to reflect on this because um, I I have this sort of census of white male Americanists, like you know, do as I say, not as I do. Right? Is is that is that come from ecological economics too, like do as I say, you need a new pathway, you can't do it like we did it. But in the meantime, we're gonna continue doing it like we've always done it, right? How do you, how do you address that in your own work? Um, that's very interesting because um, like when, when it comes to ecological economics and degrowth, it's a bit confusing um, when you address uh, some people that are, under the hegemony, the political economic hegemony of the world. Um, and it's, uh, it's in interesting to see many of them, let's say in the, in the global South, they are practicing sufficiency. They are practicing it, but not under the brand of uh, degrowth and not under the brand of ecological economics. So it's confusing because the, uh, I think this type of knowledge are uh, it's, it, they're cyclical. So the global North has consumed and reached to, the, to, the, to, to a, a point of knowledge and, um, uh, and consumption that realizes that uh, the, the basis of uh, that growth was, uh, was faulty. And uh, the global South, uh, well, and these are my, my perspective, uh, the global South um, has, been, um, has been struggling to reach to, to, to that point because they've been, um, they've been advised by that white man that you need to develop, you need to grow. That's how it works. That's why you're being, uh, you know, uh, the, that type of, um, resource curses that you see is because you're not smart enough, you're not growing your uh, economy. And then now that we, the, the, the white man has reached to the, to the peak is uh, announcing to the world that, okay, let's, let's like, consume less. <laughs> so, uh, so like coming back to the, to the baseline of uh, many of the people in the global South that they already practice those type of, um, uh, those type of, um, lifestyle. So I think we are uh, in, at this point is quite challenging to spread the word uh, to the uh, to the global south um, with this new branding of degrowth and uh, or if you want to make a, a parallel between ecological economics and degrowth but uh, but it would it will come um, as uh, the necessity comes, I, I, I believe. Yeah, we're getting some great discussion in the chat on this question as well. Um, so I really, I really appreciate that, especially around degrowth. Um, maybe, um, Martin, if, I think if I loop back to you, will everyone will have had equal opportunities for questions and then maybe we'll start to wrap things up. But um, Martin, I, I think of this question and, and maybe you can reflect on your experience in Canada, right? Um, Canada, much like the U.S., but Canada is a great example of uh, signing climate treaties, supporting climate action, 
on the global stage saying we must do more than in the same breath, mining, depleting, going after some of the dirtiest oil sources on the planet with some of the lowest energy return on investment. Um, <laughs> this question, right, of do as I say, not as I do. I mean, how, how do you reflect on that in your experience in Canada? That's so, an easy one, right? Yeah, that, that really trivial question. I really like how you put it. Uh, do as I say, not as I do is kind of the, the ultimate uh, arrogant take that, you know, comfortable white male academics from, you know, Canada can have. Not only do I not put any effort into learning about, as Tina said, philosophies that are named basically differently, but have many similar characteristics, but I show up as if I'm bringing wisdom. That, that has to be, you know, about as egregious a, a, a tact as we can do. So I, this is certainly, I speak from a place of profound ignorance on this. Do I know how to make uh, academia basically less a very specific version of itself uh, that originated in North America? No, I haven't thought of this. But as, as something that becomes clearer to me over time, much of what I know, with much of my training in technical matters is fine for various things. But as it comes to sociology, as it comes to the bigger questions of degrowth, how do we make societal change? At that point, you just have to go on a listening tour. And it doesn't kind of escape me that many of the kind of big degrowth academics are speaking from one part of the world with, you know, not a lot of buy-in from elsewhere where that term might itself be kind of a bit meaningless. So really all I can say from that perspective is one, a lot of the time, especially when it comes to these more sociological questions, more cultural questions, we can just be quiet. Uh, and two is to not do what you said. Do as I say, uh, but not as I do. That's kind of the ultimate bad take on how to approach this. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at, we're almost at the top of the hour, so we're just about out of time. Thank you all so much. Um, just to kind of, hear, for everyone to sort of just hear your own thoughts and kind of how you are approaching these very, very difficult questions. Um, through collaboration and in community. So we, we really, really appreciate your, your take on all this. Um, Rigo, how about if I kick it back to you and you can give us kind of a quick preview of tomorrow, what we have to expect, and then uh, wrap things up for today. Yeah, thank you, John, for moderating the panel. And thank you, Martin and Tina, for joining us. And, and the other panelists, Leslie and Rapke, it was a great, great day today. Um, I'm just gonna say, continuing from with what Tina and Martin just talked about, tomorrow we're gonna learn about the pluri pluriverse of radical uh, economic alternatives with Ashish uh, Kothari, and, and then he's gonna be followed by uh, Kay uh, Raworth, um, who is gonna be talking about donut economics and how we can move from theory to practice. Uh, uh, and then we'll have our last breakout group, uh, tomorrow, and I hope that people are, are playing with the En-ROADS model that I sent you guys. Uh, it's important to, to understand how you can use that, I think, to, to teach about the biophysical foundation and to apply some of the ecological economic concepts. And I would end by saying that we can actually learn more from people in the global south, and we must continue to work towards that than we can, than we can if you will, because they're already practicing what we call here ecological economics. And in many ways, they are being sufficient because they are living within their means. The global north, we allow through our financial systems to live beyond our means. And that's a fact, that's a reality. That's why we have, we need big growth here of financial and uh, material and energy, energetic needs. But I would just, I would just say that and, and, and thank you all for joining us and have a great day, great evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone, we'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget about Slack, we've got more questions. Yes, go on Slack. If you, if you have more questions for day three, I, I believe Leslie's gonna show up there. Great. Bye. Bye. Well, you're muted, Josh. I was just saying, great job. I'm really impressed. It was uh, really good lectures. I had to deal with a couple other things, so I didn't, uh, and I had to eat, so I just want my face, but really <laughs> thanks, good work. Josh. All right. Thanks for you going. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. We still have 40 people waiting for me to <laughs> shut it down.
I'll shut it down now. Take care, everyone.